Uh, so for those that are watching and have been able to join, um, welcome to the Fashion Law Edit Presents Women in Fashion Law. Um, my name is Bumi Jentfer and I'm your host today. Um, I'm also the founder of the Fashion Law Edit, which was formerly called the Fashion Law Chronicles up until a couple of months ago. Um, before we start, um, I'm going to allow the panelists to first actually introduce themselves um, and yeah, we'll take it from there. So if we can start with Lucy. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Lucy Coffey. I'm a Commerce and Technology Associate at Fox Williams. I'm also a member of our Fashion Law Group, which is made up of lawyers in commercial, corporate, employment, IP, disputes, real estate, and from time to time, financial regulation and immigration. Um, I work for fashion brands, agents, and distributors, and I um, mainly help them with setting up relationships and then managing those relationships going forwards, whether that be kind of building brand um, with uh, potential disputes, um, with performance management and things like that. Thank you, Lucy. And we uh, have Alex next. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Fashion Law Edit, for uh, extending the invitation to, uh, for me to join this panel today. I'm Alice Pang and I live in New York City. As I understand that some of the panelists as well as the attendees here are not necessarily from just the US or the UK, um, I just wanted to highlight that my family and my parents are from Malaysia and I was born and raised in Lower East Side of New York. Uh, following college, um, I became a paralegal where I work as a, uh, at an IT boutique firm. And then I decided to take a leap of faith and enter law school where I studied IT. And today I work at uh, McCarter and English, and we have a few offices in the US and I sit in the New York office. Uh, I am also in the fashion design and luxury group of my firm. I am an IP associate. We counsel clients um, from initial concept and pre-launch to uh, anti-counterfeiting enforcement. And I work primarily in uh, specializing in trademarks and copyrights and brand protection, anti-counterfeiting. Thank you, Alice. Hi, my name is Gina Bibby. I am a partner at the Withers Worldwide Law Firm. And I am the global head of Withers Fashion Tech Practice. Um, I sit in the Los Angeles office of Withers Worldwide, although we have offices all over the US and all over the world, and we're headquartered out of the UK. Um, our firm has very deep roots in servicing uh, fashion clients, um, about 30 years uh, deep practice servicing fashion clients. We also have a very large tech practice. And of course, our firm is known um, worldwide for its private client practice. What I do in particular is um, I specialize in IP, hard and soft IP. So copyright, patents, trademark. I'm a registered patent attorney here in uh, the United States. Um, I deal a lot with data privacy issues, again, IP issues, licensing issues, um, and various other corporate agreements. Um, going back a little bit in time, this is a second career for me. My first career was as a computer software engineer, so I have an undergraduate degree in computer science and mathematics, and I practiced for about 14 years in Silicon Valley doing um, complex IP litigation for the who's who list of big tech companies there. Thank you, Ali. Um, thank you, Gina, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sophia. I'm from Harp Austin Lewis, which is a media and entertainment law firm based in London. I'm an associate in the fashion group there. Um, we have a very broad team um, and advise fashion clients across a range of areas. Um, this includes corporate, commercial litigation, employment, um, reputation management and commercial. I sit in the commercial part of the fashion group. Um, I deal with numerous commercial agreements, 
mainly um, kind of at the marketing end of things. So I work on a number of ambassador agreements and sponsorship deals. We represent both brands and individuals. Um, I actually have a particular speciality in modeling, um, in particular modeling representation agreements, which is those between the model and the modeling agency. Um, but I also do a lot of work with clients in the sustainable and ethical fashion space, um, which is an area that I particularly enjoy. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, I'm Priya. I'm a corporate associate at Fox Williams, um, and along with Lucy, I'm also part of the fashion sector group. Um, I act for a range of uh, corporate clients, um, so including kind of publishing and media technology um, and um, fashion brands. Um, and we tend to advise on a range of matters, um, which go from kind of early stage investments um, to and restructuring to kind of um, advising on mergers and acquisitions. Thanks, Priya. I think what would be a good place to start um, this webinar is defining fashion law. You know, what is fashion law? Um, there's so many definitions um, that have come across the years. And it's, I feel personally that like it's quite hard to define it because of just how broad the area is. Um, I'll read up one definition in particular um, by Susan Scafidi, who is seen as um, the leading professor in fashion law. Um, and she's basically described it as, fashion law is not only a stylish subject, but also a discipline that is here to stay. The words fashion and law were not linked and fashion law was not a recognized area of legal expertise. Today, a few short years later, there is a, a burgeoning international legal field made to measure for the business of fashion. So I'm just gonna hand it over to you guys, starting with Lucy, and just tell us what is fashion law? Thank you. I, I think fashion law is really kind of an industry specific focus. Um, you know, it will depend on what the, the client needs and wants as to what kind of lawyers or what type of law might be involved. Um, so fashion clients might come to um, law firms or uh, you know, in -house, their in-house lawyers to discuss issues such as, um, I don't know, setting up brand protection, in which case they'd want to look to IP lawyers and commercial lawyers, or perhaps they have issues um, with employment contracts as to who owns that IP, so they might go to employment lawyers. Um, likewise, they, they, do, um, they might have issues, they might be um, having a dispute with someone. Uh, for me, fashion law is kind of a sector focus, as I said, and the kind of the body of law which is relevant to it is really vast. It completely depends on the objectives of the client um, and you know that that's what's great. It's, uh, it kind of brings all types of law together um, in a really kind of diverse way. Yeah. Alice. So I echo uh, Lucy's sentiments exactly. I think fashion law is its own separate um, animal, but I do think that it's a very enticing, appealing, and sexy way of just saying the way to do business with respect to designers and other brands. Um, Fashion law encompasses everything from pre-launch pre and initial concepts and protection of those ideas, um, as well as any licensing and manufacturing issues that might arise. And then it goes down the pipe to you know post-production and uh, gray goods in terms of uh, IP protection, as well as anti-counterfeiting uh, efforts to prevent knockoffs from um, per uh, pervading the market. So. But aside from IP, there's also other issues, right, that touch upon any other industry, like employment, corporate issues, retail and rental space issues. So um, I, I think fashion law is more than just uh, fashion. It's actually the business of doing, um, providing the services for your client that needs to help them with everything from the beginning to the very end of uh, the product line. Thank you. Uh, Gina, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, I actually do. So I agree with both Lucy and Alice that fashion law is all encompassing and it touches many disciplines all the way from corporate transactions to corporate formation, labor and employment, IP, real estate, all of that. But when I'm asked this question, 
um, the way I see fashion law, which differentiates it from any other uh, law and servicing any other client is it necessitates in my mind, a deep understanding of the business of fashion, how the industry works, you know, all the way down to, you know, the nomenclature, what is meant by a tech pack, how, how are um, products priced. And I have um, a perfect example of that. I've, I've been working on a patent licensing deal for a bit of fashion tech for a um, sustainable activewear brand that's actually owned by a very world famous athlete. And, you know, there were some questions in that deal around how to set royalty rates. Well, that took some investigation on, you know, in this particular area, what are the royalty rates that are being set in fashion and why are the, those royalty rates what they are? And so just a normal IP licensing lawyer would not have access to that type of information and not know where to go to look for it. So I do think that fashion law is very specialized in that regard, in, in particular, when you're talking about understanding the inner workings of the industry. Thank you. Um, so Peter, um, what's your take on this? Um, I think from my experience, I probably, um, have most of my opinions probably most aligned with Lucy and Alice's just kind of taking um, for example a, a startup fashion brand that might come to us in terms of how our advice would be framed it would kind of be first of all um, you know looking at any residential agreements that they may need in place for any any properties or you know obviously any shops um, whether they need employment agreements in place whether there's any trademarks they need to register or other intellectual property then kind of looking to, um, you know, the more commercial side, do they need website T's and C's, do they need privacy policy, um, do they need agreements, you know, for um, arrangements along the supply chain. So I, I agree in that I think fashion law can come in so many shapes and forms, and I think it needs, a, you know, huge variation of lawyers actually to kind of fully advise a fashion brand um, and to kind of provide that, I guess, full service. Thank you. And Priya, your take? Um, I mean, I, yeah, comp again, completely agree with what, um, what everyone has said. I think it is really kind of an all-encompassing area. Um, it really does involve kind of so many different um, specialisms. Um, I think it's definitely a growing area um, in terms of the sector focus, um, which, you know, could well be, you know, due to kind of like the growth in like social media and like the internet age. Um, and there really are just so many different parts of, um, of the legal field um, and the fashion industry that kind of integrate. Um, and I think kind of getting kind of legal advice from, you know, all those different areas, like as Sophie just mentioned, um, Sophie just mentioned, it's kind of, it really does go from kind of, yeah, you know, from the advice from like the real estate team, um, you know, through sort of like corporate employment and as well as kind of, you know, the more traditional kind of commercial and IP aspects that people might traditionally think of. Um, but essentially, I think, um, yeah legal advice is just kind of paramount to making sure that you know that all operates and integrates together yeah i mean i think it's quite interesting to hear all of your views and i honestly do agree with that um for me personally i was in a clubhouse discussion and it was tailored to um the lawyers who are into intellectual property and music lawyers or you know the smaller niche areas of law and one of the things that stri strikes me from one of the um, speakers who was a music lawyer was saying, basically, there isn't anything like fashion law the same way there's nothing really like um, entertainment law or music law, you know, at the heart of it. Basically, all it is, is the commercial side of fashion. Um, and I mean, personally, I, I could see where they were going with it, but then... I kind of disagreed with that because like you said, it is an all encompassing area of law. There are so many different areas, like many areas of law that make up fashion law. So to just level it down directly to commercial law, it's, it, I don't personally, for me, I don't think it's right. I think there's just so many other areas of law that make up fashion law, um, like you've all rightly said. I think there are common trends, you know, as with all industries. Um, you know, the certain things that we'll touch on the work that all of us do on this webinar. Um, but you know, yes, as you say, I mean, there really 
it will completely depend on what it is that you're trying to achieve or, or what, what you want to do um, as a business. And, you know, being able to get the advice to do that can come from a variety of different lawyers. Yeah, I agree. I think this also kind of leads on to then yourselves individually, you know, how did you yourselves, you know, yes, become a lawyer, but also navigate through the niche of fashion law? You know, how did you get started? Um, did you do courses? Um, did you do an inter internship that led you to be a fashion lawyer? So if I start with Lucy, and if you could just tell us, you know, how did you get into this area of law? Sure. Um, well, in the UK, internships aren't as big a thing as I think probably Alice and Gina might talk to you in respect to the US. But um, I came from, uh, I trained at a, at a large uh, law firm uh, where um, I did a variety of different seats because I wanted to try and be as broad as possible, not with a particular area of law or industry in mind at the time. Um, I actually ended up qualifying into finance um, in restructuring and insolvency law. And so I saw a different side to the high street as the one that I see now, or the one perhaps pre-COVID and Brexit I was seeing, um, you know, working on things like CBAs and finance kind of arrangements for, for companies. And I decided to move into commercial law uh, shortly after qualifying, um, moved across to Fox Williams because of the kind of fashion law uh, specialism in my team and the partner that I work for. Um, it is, you know, I, I did a client's secondment uh, at a bank. I didn't do kind of one in fashion, but uh, working in-house, I think, um, in any kind of industry can help you kind of work out how businesses move and, you know, how they have law, um, kind of legal advice can help businesses move. And once you've got those skills, it doesn't necessarily matter kind of what area you've got them in or what industry you've got them in but you can kind of develop a, a skilled bank as a junior lawyer, and then you can work out, in my personal experience, you can work out then what you want to specialize in, whether that be an industry, whether it be a type of law. And for me, commercial practice is so broad. I'm sure Sophia probably finds the same, most days you don't do the same thing as the previous day. Um, it, once you kind of uh, accept that, you're never gonna you know, be doing the same kind of documents day in, day out. Um, it, it's great, it's a great area to specialize in. Um, and you know, I think the reason I chose to specialize in commercial work at Fox Williams was for the fashion side of things. Um, you know, we do the tech work as well, but um, kind of being able to develop my skills as a lawyer now into fashion law is, is great, um, but it isn't necessarily something that I started Kind of with an objective of, of doing when I, when I first started my career but now I found it that's what I'm focused on developing um, you know by way of business development by way of um, the work that we do um, and the kind of associations and things that we're involved in um, Alice I don't know how that compares with with your experience so I guess it's a little different, although I also similarly wasn't necessarily looking to dive in straight into fashion law. Um, as I said a little earlier, following college, I worked as a paralegal at an IP boutique law firm in Manhattan. And following three years, I realized there was no progression aside from taking the, the big step to go to law school, which I did. And in law school, I knew I wanted to focus on IP and uh, specifically trademarks and copyrights, but I didn't necessarily have um, some idea as to what industry I was just trying to be brought as well. And following the market during that time, it was um, after the crash in 2008, I just knew that economically um, the job markets were, uh, job market wasn't doing so well. So I also knew that I didn't have the, the leisure to really pick and choose at that point. So. Keeping that in mind, I um, tried to get as many internships and externships as possible during my summer and my law school um, uh, semesters. And I worked at MetLife in-house. I also worked uh, for a judge in the Eastern District of um, New York. And then I was able to also get internships at the fashion houses of Burberry and Stuart Weitzman. And it was actually in those uh, experiences that I realized I really enjoyed fashion and the fa and working in a fashion house. 
because I saw the day in day work and also it really helped make me a more practical and pragmatic practitioner today. I was able to realize uh, the concerns of the legal department, not just the attorney, but the paralegal and the staff that assist the legal department in these uh, companies. And I, I thought that was just amazing, that insight. So keeping that in mind, I then wanted to focus on fashion, uh, fashion law and IP. Unfortunately, like I said, uh, the market wasn't, um, wasn't very saturated with jobs at that point. So I don't even know how, but I landed at the law firm I'm at, McCarter and English. Um, I was able to find this position and they were looking for two second to fourth year and I was out of law school. So I, you know, clamored for it and I really um, spoke to the recruiter trying to have her press for me and luckily they gave me a position and it just so happened that when I came into the firm, we had a very high profile case involving a very famous shoe um, and trademark and trademark law and I was part of that litigation. Um, and then at the same time, we were representing a very high end um, uh, jewelry designer and there was counterfeiting that was happening all over uh, Manhattan. And I got to work um, primarily with that big designer in shutting down a huge ring of um, distributors of their goods. And I just, it's just so the, the star and the moon aligned, I guess. So I was very lucky to find myself in that position. And that was my first year uh, out of law school. Um, it was very intense, I'll say that. It's not as glamorous as you would imagine because uh, you're still a lawyer at the end of the day and whatever you do costs money. So, you know, legally, um, you love, I love the work, but you do have to keep in mind your clients, your clients bottom line and as well as their expectations was something that I learned uh, very early on. And I think the internships were also very helpful because I realized what it is that they're looking for, right? Like they're not looking for a legal brief on an examination of the law. They're looking for um, measurable results that they can show their, their higher ups and maybe um, other people that they have to also speak to. So um, I, that was how I entered fashion law. And, you know, since then it's been, it's been a, it's still a lesson in many ways uh, because with the digitalization and now the pandemic, you know, everyone's pivoting, including these big fashion brands. So it's, it's been, um, it's been a very interesting ride. And I think fashion law is still evolving, which is why it's been hard to, for us to define it too. So I'm pretty sure a practitioner from 10 years ago will define fashion law very differently from someone maybe 10 years from now. Um, so that's how I entered fashion law. Thank you, uh, Lucy and Alice. And Gina, I know you have like quite a different background. Like you said, you know, this wasn't, you had something you were doing before um, actually entering fashion law, um, especially because your background is very tech heavy. Um, so please do share more on your background and how you entered into fashion law. Sure. So um, I always had a fascination or interest in fashion. My mother was a bit of a fashionista and so um, it was something I always paid attention to and um, you are correct my path is very unconventional because I you know I was an engineer and engineers aren't really that into fashion <laughs> from my experience and um, but I was practicing, as I said earlier today, in um, Silicon Valley doing complex IP litigation, a lot of um, that included, you know, patent litigation on some super high tech things. And I did that for, frankly speaking, 14 years in Silicon Valley. But I always had it in my head that um, I wanted to try a practice that not all of the old guys running the big firms I worked at were thinking about. And I knew I was really good at tech and I knew I was really good at IP. And I started to notice the convergence of fashion and technology. And my first um, introduction to it was I learned about a collaboration between Google and Levi Strauss 
and they were coming up with a what they called the commuter jacket the project was called project jacquard and they were weaving semiconductor material into fabric so that the same way that you could use the touch screen on your phone or your computer you could um, introduce that capability technical capability into textiles and i thought this is amazing um, so I was involved in a patent litigation matter um, and spending a lot of time in our New York City office. And I thought, well, you know, if there's a fashion law course, it has to be in New York City. And so I did some research and it turned out that Susan Scafitti had just started, who you mentioned earlier, the uh, Fashion Law Institute. And she had a boot camp course in fashion law for a week. And um, I would work in the day and take the course at night. And then after that, she offered a course in Silicon Valley on fashion tech. I took that course and I decided that I was going to start a practice. And I tried doing it in the confines of, you know, the AMLA 50 firm that I was working at at the time. And I, I got a lot of really good feedback from the management committee of the firm, but one management committee member said, you know, the chairman of the firm wants to stay in conventional high tech and, and um, energy. And so I decided to take a leap of faith and I committed to um, starting my own fashion tech practice and I would do it for a year. If I failed miserably, I would go back to doing what I was doing. And if I succeeded, I would make a decision of what to do at that time. And so I left Silicon Valley, started my own fashion tech firm. Uh, by the grace of God, it was very successful. And then I moved my practice to a larger platform of Withers because of its longstanding fashion expertise and uh, tech expertise. So. That's how I got here. Thank you, Gina. And I mean, I know we'll touch upon this more in the Q&A section, especially because people have been asking about that. But it's really interesting that you spoke on uh, the Fashion Law Institute by um, Susan Scafidi, uh, because I know a lot of people and like myself earlier on today, I was kind of thinking about, should I do the boot camp course? Um, not necessarily because I want to be qualified in that area, but I think it would be like a good top up just to, you know, broaden my horizon into the world of fashion law. Um, so it's kind of really interesting to hear that actually you did do the boot camp and how you found it. Yeah, I, I will say absolutely. I tell young people all the time who are looking to go to law school and want to get in fashion law. I, I think taking that course is eye opening because it taught me about a business that I frankly knew nothing about. And that was my goal to learn the business because in my mind, and I alluded to this earlier, you know, any lawyer can do corporate, IP, real estate, all of that. But what will really differentiate you is how much you know about the business of the clients that you're serving. And so I, that was the reason I took those courses. And when I started my own law firm, I actually didn't open up the firm uh, immediately. I, I, I spent two months learning all that I could about fashion. I cold called general counsels of fashion brands in Northern California and Southern California. I went to all different kinds of events and people would ask me, oh, are you a designer? And I would say, no, I'm a lawyer. And they're like, what are you doing here? I said, I'm learning about the business of fashion. So that's that's my recommendation. Learn everything you can about the business. It makes such a difference. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, and Sophia, if we come to you and, you know, how you ended up where you are now. Yeah, I guess mine's probably a little bit more traditional in that um, I did my undergraduate law degree firstly. Um, and when graduating, I think I just kind of did what all my friends were doing, which was applying to all those magic circle law firms um, in the UK and trying to convince them that I was really, really interested in their, uh, you know, high value financial deals. Um, but I was unsuccessful with those applications. And I think the reason was that I, you know, I didn't really have that passion for, um, you know, some of those areas. And it was just very clear to me that 
um, you know, I probably wasn't very convincing in my interviews. So it was only really until I, I then did my legal practice course, um, which in the UK is kind of the step between your degree and then um, practicing in law. And I did the media and entertainment law module. And I think I had a bit of a light bulb moment where I suddenly realized that law could actually be really interesting and really, you know, really fun. And I was, I genuinely felt like I'd found an area that I was really happy to read the articles before our seminars and, you know, read um, business of fashion over a coffee. And I found it really, really interesting. So I think that kind of sparked my interest, um, but it wasn't until I, started um, my training contract at Harbottle and Lewis that I really got to kind of get involved with um, some of the you know fashion law work um, and kind of how it works in practice and I think that um, how it really started I think um, timing was quite good in that when I was um, in my media and entertainment seat we had a new client um, come on board called the responsible trust for models um, and the CEO and founder is a really inspirational lady that is basically, um, you know, she works with all parts of the fashion industry, but the goal is to kind of make modeling safer and more sustainable and ethical. Um, and what she wanted us to do was to give like a training session to a lot of models at the London College of Fashion, just about commercial contracts um, and, you know, the implications of entering into contracts and to just really try to um, help models who most of them, you know, are often scouted in their, you know, teens, they're so young, um, really was just to educate them a bit about, you know, being, um, not just being a face and a model, but making sure that, you know, modeling is your business and, you know, how to financially um, and legally set yourself up to protect your image and make sure that you're obviously kind of protecting that and exploiting it in the right way so um that was what really kind of um yeah I guess clasped my clasped my interest in fashion law and kind of from then I've been working with her for the last two years and we've done some really great work together um and I think that's probably been the highlight of my career so far is I guess kind of coming from that commercial angle but actually really helping some of these young models navigate the early stages of their careers where you know they're very excited about you know entering the fashion and modeling industry and actually you know you need to take a step back and make sure that um the contracts in place are protecting them um and you know it's an even playing field between them and the agencies so that's been a real highlight and kind of seeing those models progress and you know seeing them and different billboards and tv adverts and you know seeing them kind of come a long way um but also you know also some of the more high profile models and fashion brands that we work for as well i think like they're always a highlight just you know some of the names that come across your desk it's always quite exciting but i think as alice was saying at the end of it it is still law um you know it is just kind of it, an exciting person that you're working for so the nitty gritty kind of legal day-to-day -day work is the same so you do still need to kind of have that motivation and have that passion for that um but I think like yeah I think part of your question for this as well was also um like what some of the challenges have been and um I'd say like working with a responsible trust and models like has been a real highlight but I think um it's also opened my eyes a little bit to I guess maybe it's like some of the more darker sides of the fashion industry and that you know there are some brands out there that will exploit models and um, you know other I guess um, stages and companies along the supply chain um, and I think I think that has been eye-opening but it's also really um, rewarding I guess to be um, in a position where you can kind of help those people navigate through those situations um, so yeah that's kind of been my journey to where I am today. Thank you. And I mean, it's really interesting that you touched upon the modelling side of it, um, especially like the legal um, things of it, because even here at the Fashion Law Edit, a couple of years back, we did a campaign um, during London Fashion Week in 2016, I believe, um, where we actually interviewed um, Rosie Nelson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, um, who basically had been campaigning um, and you know the political side on you know the UK should bring legislation to protect you know models especially when it comes to their health 
um, and, you know, the requirements um, around that because far too many times we've, you know, all seen and heard where a model's health is put into question, whether they're too fat or too skinny or too thin. And then that just leads into, unfortunately, you know, really bad consequences for the models themselves. So having like yeah. some sort of legal framework. So yes, you know, when it comes to contracts for models, but, you know, other sides of it as well, it's really, really good. Um, and last but not least, uh, Priya, your um, take on how you entered into fashion law. Um, so I've, I've, I've always had an interest um, in fashion kind of in general. Um, I mean, when I was, you know, when I was trying to think of, you know, what I wanted to do when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I actually was kind of, before I signed up to the GDL, it was kind of either I wanted to be a lawyer or actually I was considering being a fashion buyer and I appreciate those are two very, very different things, but that's kind of just because that's kind of what my, where my interest is. Um, Lied um, and went so I did my training contract and during um, during that I was lucky enough to do a seat at Arcadia so I worked in their in-house legal team for one of my seats um, and I think that's really where I kind of got to understand um, and again like as everyone else has kind of touched on the business of fashion and kind of like what it actually meant to be um, you know a fashion lawyer as I as we're talking about um, and it was kind of like the variety of work that I was doing that was really interesting to me because I think beforehand I kind of thought as fashion law as being really just mainly kind of IP focused um, and I hadn't really appreciated kind of everything else that you know that went into it um, but when I was on to comment you know like one minute I'd be doing um, you know kind of commercial like distribution agreements supply contracts the next minute I would be working on these kind of quite high profile um, IP litigation. And then the next minute I would be kind of doing kind of more things on the corporate side. And that's kind of really when I got to understand kind of everything that went into um, making that business operate. And I think um, as kind of Alice um, mentioned, it was really interesting to kind of be beyond that side of, um, of the fence in terms of actually um, you know, seeing what a business wants when, when they, they're asking for legal advice. I think like sometimes um, as you know as a trainee or as a junior lawyer in private practice you can sometimes like kind of operate in a vacuum whereas really um the people that i you know i was reporting to in the business at arcadia were kind of very um precise in terms of like how they wanted things so it really kind of taught me you know as a you know as a trainee lawyer what was important for the business um so i mean that's kind of where like most of my you know knowledge came from and that's kind of when i realized okay fine I, I want to be a corporate lawyer but actually I, I can still have like I can still kind of have a fashion um sector focus even while being a corporate lawyer and not you know as I thought you know I thought I would kind of have to go down the IP route to do this um and that's when I when I was applying for NQ roles um that's what attracted me to Fox Williams was because they had this fashion sector group and I knew that as a corporate lawyer I still would be able to kind of um pursue that interest um uh, yeah I think um again you know we're saying in terms of like highlights in terms of what you know your kind of career so far um that's being a as, as a, a lawyer in, in fashion I think Arcadia kind of is probably one of my kind of career highlights to date because I think it really did give me um kind of such an oversight um in terms of what you know what a fashion business needs and you know what it needs to operate and that kind of really comes down to um you know like the financing of the company as well as you know protecting the IP um, you know and you know all, all the kind of like distribution um, agreements that you know they have um, so yeah I think that was probably the highlight in terms of you know for me in terms of getting to know what um, you know operating in fashion law meant. Thank you Priya I mean just hearing all of you speak I think one of the key takeaways here is so far you know making sure you know the business of fashion and pretty much links to commercial awareness like commercial awareness is key um, if you generally want to go into law, but specifically into fashion law, you have to have commercial awareness and you do have to be, you know, on top of it at all times um, to, you know, basically know what the business needs of you. And also just seeing and hearing actually, you know, the different routes that you've each taken. Um, so, you know, the traditional routes, the unconventional routes, um, it's really, really inspiring. And I think it speaks a lot, especially to those who are watching. Um, you know, there isn't one linear way of going into fashion law. You can draw upon so many experiences, um, past and present to 
lead you into this path and I think which is really really good because for me personally I had no fashion background I didn't even know what fashion law was basically up until I went to an event in 2017 and basically and it was a fashion event um, and the host basically said you know you could get into fashion law by um, you could get into the fashion industry basically by looking up fashion law which is basically the legal and business side of fashion and I thought well cool like you know that could replace my lack of fashion industry experience and I could compensate with my legal knowledge and legal experience and from then on I just read up on you know using the business of fashion to keep me up to speed on what was going on um I also use the fashion law, the blog, which is in the US to, you know, which is a great provider of constant and daily um, fashion law news. Um, so, yeah, I just think, you know, for everyone there, commercial awareness is pretty much very, very key. And I think that slides on to our next segment in terms of the future of fashion from a legal perspective. Um, so, I mean, within the last couple of years, we've, us in here in the UK, we've dealt with Brexit and what that's meant for pretty much every area of society, but mainly for the fashion industry. And then with the onset of the pandemic, which basically took everyone by surprise last year, and we can definitely see just how much the fashion industry um, has changed from the way us as consumers shop using online, um, the decline of high street stores. Um, so just hearing from you guys, um, what's the legal, um, what legal perspective can you tell us in terms of the future of fashion? Jack, should I kick off? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's so many different ways that things can change so quickly. And I think that's what the last 12 months probably have, have shown to us all. Um, you know, short term, things will still be concentrated, at least in the UK and Europe, on, on things such as um, Brexit and COVID. Um, you know, we're seeing things COVID related um, all the time in terms of um, contracts being cancelled. Um, where, where do kind of products go? Where, where do um, items end up in that kind of circumstance? Um, and then Brexit in respect of duties, payments, how is that affecting the end consumer? Do brands and businesses, can they, can they afford to swallow those additional costs that they're now being faced with having been, having thought of uh, free trade as, as the way forward? And I think for the, you know, for the foreseeable future, that's gonna still be an issue for a lot of fashion brands agents and distributors all along the supply chain um, but you know those things will only last to such an extent and then they'll probably be taken over by something else that comes up but in terms of something that I think is is really key at the moment but will only get more and more important is this push on sustainability and transparency um, consumers are demanding you know the transparency through the supply chain they want to know where they're their clothes come from, they want to know that they're buying from reputable brands. Um, that's only going to continue to increase in pressure. You take things such as uh, something that we were looking at um, uh, from a kind of a business development perspective recently is the Sustainable Apparel Coalition and the HIG Index, uh, which is kind of a association for apparel, footwear and textile businesses um, to measure their supply chains in terms of um, you know, various different factors, including things like environmental and um, modern slavery. Um, many brands have signed up to this uh, coalition, uh, such as uh, Allbirds, Boohoo, um, you know, H&M. And, you know, when there comes this kind of push for sustainability, there also comes this possibility that um, uh, not everything that's being reported is, is clear enough and you know we see that in the UK with changes to modern slavery uh, what needs to be reported by companies in terms of what they're doing to ensure that their supply chains are as they should be and as are um, acceptable uh, to you know uh, consumers and businesses and shareholders and you know anyone that's involved in the business of fashion whether that be from the top to the you know very much the output of the product itself so for me I think in the work that we do sustainability and transparency will definitely be something that continues to get more and more important over um, years and years to come. Thank you. And Alice, um, if I could hear from you as well. 
Sure. Um, I, I echo Lucy's sentiments. Um, I think that there are, so in terms of the future of fashion in the immediate sense, it's going to be um, sort of like a recovery of the recent um, um, recouping of the losses of revenue from the pandemic, for example. Um, I think that there's going to be a focus on revving up now that things are opening up in certain parts of the world and uh, the vaccines being rolled out. I think a lot of fashion brands as well as other businesses are looking to be prepared that once things are open, that they're going to be able to uh, generate the profits that they lost during that that time period. So I think that's the immediate future right now. Um, but then there's also the undercurrent of technology that's uh, pervasive in all industries that I think is finding itself in fashion. As Gina mentioned earlier, you know, tech uh, smartware is becoming an increasing um, an increasing uh, the uh, increasing in fashion, like they're trying to find ways to innovate and to make a product that's functional, but also aesthetically appealing. So I see, for example, um, technology being incorporated more in uh, retail and apparel. And we see that um, with our clients, but also um, in terms of transparency and supply chain, uh, blockchain is also something that, you know, a lot of other businesses are have already implemented like healthcare, but fashion is also now looking at because of the fact that they want to be able to know their component parts, where they derive from, and then from there to assembly and then ending up on uh, the shelf of a retail store. They want to be able to know exactly where it started to where it ended up. Um, and it's so it's also keeping in line that you have to not only keep abreast of legal issues, um, which are very important, obviously, as practitioners, we have uh, a duty to continue to t educate ourselves, right, in like legal developments, but we also have to educate ourselves in terms of what's uh, happening out there in terms of technology that can impact our clients, because we do have in a vested interest in many ways in um, the way that technology can actually um, impact the bottom line and our work and how to, to be able to anticipate those needs. So. Uh, I think the future of fashion is uh, going to get more techno techno uh, technologically advanced. And similarly, we will also have to be a little more savvy in that space too. Um, so I, I, that's where I see technology, uh, the future of fashion heading. It's going more and more towards a digital and uh, technologically advanced uh, platform. Thank you, Alice. And I think carrying on from the technological side of things. Um, Gina, if you could, you know, share your insights on that. Sure, so full disclosure, I am a self-proclaimed um, fashion tech evangelist. Um, uh, I do not think tech is going anywhere. Technology is uh, pervasive in every industry, fintech, clean tech. I mean, it's all over the world. And I frankly think that the pandemic has um, pushed more industries, including fashion, in towards technology. Um, I'm a realist, though, even though I'm an evangelist. And um, so I think three things. I think fashion is going to move more and more towards technology. I think fashion, as was mentioned as well, is going to move towards sustainability. And thirdly, I think um, fashion is going to move towards um, transparency. I will tell you from my experiences with clients I, I, and also some of my board memberships, I sit on the board of the California Fashion Association. I sit on the board of a nonprofit in San Francisco called Remake, which is all about sustainability. Um, so what I see in the fashion industry, there's a culture resistance. So in the fashion industry, protecting one's um, suppliers and where you're sourcing things is a huge deal. I don't know how this culture evolved or why it evolved, but I don't see the fashion industry um, moving away from that 
very quickly unless they're forced to. And that gets me to sustainability. I think that consumers are going to be the ones that will push the fashion industry towards sustainability and towards transparency. I do not think the fashion industry will do it in and of themselves. Um, you know, and the fashion industry, frankly, has to realize that you can, um, you can make money because you do good. It's not a matter of, you know, making money over here and then doing good over here. You can really drive your bottom line by doing good. And that's around people sustainability and product sustainability and transparency and all of that. And so I think once the fashion industry makes that cultural shift, then we'll be off to the races. On the technology side of things, I think the pan pandemic was really eye-opening for an industry that is also resistant to technology adoption. Um, many brands, including luxury br brands, are moving more online. And what that means is that brands have to be able to deliver product in an Amazonian type um, construct because you know people are just accustomed to that. You have an Amazon Prime account, you want something two days from now and um, you get it. And brands and fashion companies, both emerging and established, won't be able to do that and build those efficiencies into their businesses in the absence of technology. Um, and technology is a huge um, driver around sustainability too. There's a company here, uh, a startup here um, in Los Angeles called Amber Cycle. And what they're doing is taking uh, dead stock uh, synthetic fabrics and they put the fabric into some chemical process and out come these little plastic pellets that can then be repurposed. There are bioengineered fabrics from mushrooms and you know, the sky is the limit, robotics. Nike is now using a fashion tech startup in Northern California called Snagit. And they've come up with innovation that allows their robots to harness static electricity. And so now Nike can produce shoes at, you know, 10, 10 times an order of magnitude times the rate that it could previously using manual labor and other types of uh, machinery. So that's where I think the uh, industry is going but it ain't gonna be an easy road because I just find that fashion, the fashion industry is not, um, they're not so willing to adopt new things. Thank you, Gina. I mean, you touched upon, I think one of the points of, you know, the luxury fashion brands moving, moving to online. And I mean, we saw a lot of the fashion shows were made available online. Um, a lot of the things that us, is normal people wouldn't just have access to you know before you would have to be someone you know well connected working in the fashion industry to be able to see all these catwalks you know up and personal um but given the pandemic and obviously you know we can't meet in person it was made all online and i think that was i guess a good start in including everybody um in this sort of thing um and it's not just made to exclusive you know people um, who have connections. Uh, Sophia, um, your take. Yeah, I think firstly, um, kind of like what everybody else has said, I think um, kind of labeling and sustainability will be at the forefront. And I think from a legal perspective, it's really important because currently there isn't any legal definition of, you know, a, or a standard that brands need to meet you know, to be sustainable or to call themselves sustainable and also ethical as well, you know, how the product has kind of reached the consumer. Um, and on top of that, what is sustainable and ethical to consumers can mean different things. So, um, you know, for one person, it might mean that it's been produced locally or for someone else, it might mean that, um, you know, there's less carbon emissions or from an ethical perspective, you know, it's not um, you know, products don't include animal fur. So I think kind of producing some form of legal definition of um, or standard that brands can meet to be able to label themselves as sustainable or ethical fashion brands would be really important because currently there's a lot of brands out there that are calling themselves sustainable and, you know, and very, you know, ethical fashion. But um, actually, you know, it's what 
you know, I guess the industry calls um, greenwashing and actually they're freeloading on the hard work of a lot of other fashion brands that are truly sustainable and ethical um, and actually have invested a lot of money to kind of, you know, be able to call themselves that. So I think first and foremost, that's really important um, to kind of set those um, perimeters and the definitions um, to enable brands to you know, call themselves sustainable, and which will then ultimately enable the consumer to trust that label as well. So I think that's really important. And obviously, from a legal perspective, um, that will be something that we can help advise um, and obviously implement in the future. Um, I think kind of following on from that, increased sustainability um, will probably follow through in the UK as a result of Brexit. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, red tape on imports in the UK. Um, so there's now a huge increase in demand for um, local manufacturers, um, which obviously is great for the environment because there's less carbon footprint. Um, but I think there'll be the challenge for that as well, because in the UK, we don't have many skilled workers or manufacturing units to kind of manufacture those um, you know, the clothing ourselves to, I guess, meet those demands. So I think obviously the fashion industry is struggling at the moment in terms of, um, you know, getting the items and making those profits as a result of Brexit, which obviously um, has been really difficult. But I guess on top of that, there is a real opportunity for the UK to, um, I guess, see, you know, see this as an opportunity to, um, I guess, get that specialist industry um, standards in terms of being you know very ethical in the manufacturers that we hopefully um i guess implement and and can be a leader in the field in you know globally in terms of being um a, a very ethical manufacturing country i think currently we don't have any button manufacturers or zip manufacturers or dye houses so we're really struggling to manufacture our own products um but hopefully obviously off the back of brexit there will be kind of a higher demand for the UK to manufacture our own products. So I think, um, you know, going forwards, that will be a trend for the for the UK in particular. But I think kind of as well, just mirroring what everyone else said about tech, I think it's just inevitable that obviously there's going to be a transition to much more online shopping as a result of the pandemic as well. Um, and, you know, there's questions whether that's good for the environment or not. Um, obviously, shopping habits are very different. I know friends that order 30 items from ASOS to try on and then send you know the majority of them back so you know is that good for the environment those deliveries um and then obviously the return of those items as well it's also those carbon emissions so it's going to be interesting to see how that kind of interrelates with the sustainable side of things but i think you know the tech side of thing is just is so interesting and i feel like you know the possibilities are endless i see articles flying around that just are so interesting um you know I know Louis Vuitton recently designed outfits for characters on Fortnite um I don't game so I don't know much about Fortnite but you know the collaboration between the two I think is so interesting and to be able to sell virtual clothing um I think is just yeah you know just baffling but if there's a demand for it then is that where it's going particularly with influencers as well Obviously, you know, they always want their new outfit and their new photos. Um, is it cheaper and is it better for the environment to, um, you know, have digital clothing? But I guess on top of that as well, there's also, um, we've seen the emergence of CGI models, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's just interesting to see whether, you know, these technologies will take off. Um, I think from a consumer perspective, looking at an item of clothing on a, CGI model, I don't think I'll be quite as convinced as to, you know, whether I think it would look right on me, um, because I guess the assumption is that it's been quite highly edited. Um, so, it, you know, whether consumers will go for that or not, but I think it's, it, it's, we're going to see so much change over the next 10 years. Um, there's so many kind of interrelated elements, and I think tech and sustainability will be at the forefront of that. Thank you, Sophia. And last but not least, Priya. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, and so I think in the short to midterm, there's still, you know, the industry is kind of, you know, going to continue in this kind of um, recovery mode, um, just because of how badly, especially in the UK, that it's been hit um, over the last, um, you know, six months to a year. Um, I mean, there has been, I think, in the, say, in the last six months, there's been, you know, a lot of acquisitions in the industry, which, you know, 
generally it's I would say in the UK it's not really a traditionally acquisitive industry but because of um you know because of the you know the number of retailers that have been struggling there have been a lot of opportunities opportunistic acquisitions um and we have seen kind of a lot of consolidation um within the sector um and I think um that will kind of continue to some extent um over the next six months to a year um but I also do think you know that kind of when we kind of come out of that we will see you know some of um you know some established brands and some of the newer brands like some of the you know um the startup um fashion tech companies and that kind of thing that they will start to um you know seek new investment and i think that's kind of where new opportunities um in the industry will kind of start to come about um i think um as everyone else has kind of touched on i think sustainability um is going to continue to be um a huge um, theme in the industry. And I think that will, as, again, as, as we mentioned, I think that will largely be kind of um, consumer driven. Um, what I have noticed from a from a corporate perspective is that it's, it, for some people, it is having an impact even in terms of the type of investment that they'll consider. So I've, you know, I have had kind of informal conversations with um, you know, founders of like some sustainable brands. And even though they are seeking investment, they're very conscious that that investment needs to come from a you know a certain type of company because they want to protect um this you know protect their brand image you know they've established themselves as a sustainable company and they don't want to have lose sight of that so I think that from definitely from kind of um a corporate perspective that's going to be kind of an interesting um, um you know an interesting space to watch really um and then another kind of point again kind of on the sustainability theme is um uh, there are kind of more and more fashion brands who are looking to kind of be certified as B Corp. So um, B Corps are, you know, um, kind of, um, organisations that kind of balance profit purpose. So um, I know that, um, you know, footwear brands like Vivo Barefoot, which um, some people may have heard of, that is kind of a, a B Corp certified company. And essentially what they do is they'll sell footwear and then when you're done with it, you can send it back to them and then, they will recycle it into a new pair of shoes um, and then you get a discount on the next pair. But I think that kind of thing um, is something that I think we will see uh, a lot more of um, going forward. Um, and again, you know, continuing on that theme, like, you know, in, I think it was in February of this year, um, we did see kind of quite a lot of, um, you know, big high street brands such as like H&M, Bershka, um, M&S and like Pull and Bear who all signed up to this um, a circular fashion partnership, which is kind of a, um, a recycling scheme based in Bangladesh, and the, essentially the the purpose of that is to make sure that fashion becomes more circular and there is kind of less um, you know less wastage, and that is something you know that we are seeing brands starting to sign up to now. So I think again, that's the kind of like trends that I think we're gonna we're gonna see kind of going forward. So I just saw a question come up in the chat that I think it's relevant to the conversation we're having and it's what impact does AI have on fashion law and IP and I can definitely answer that question and others I, I'm sure have um, may have input on that so I actually have fa fashion tech clients that are operating in the AI space um, I have a client that's based out of Silicon Valley their engineering team is in the Ukraine and they have come up, which we've received a patent on a um, technology for apparel fit, um, remote apparel fit that doesn't involve body scanners and all of that. It involves 3D technology and artificial intel intelligence technology. And what this, um, my client's uh, tool allows brands to do is to incorporate their technology at their website or whatever the customer interface is. And so customers, rather than buying a bunch of clothing online and having it come back, Ill, having it delivered and it's ill-fitting and then you're sending it back, which I think Sophia alluded to in this call, you can get your precise body measurements from your mobile phone that information that the, you take two photos, it gets uploaded to my client's servers and then it churns using artificial and 3D technology and will give you your precise body measurements. So things like that um, are really, really important. But the one area where I think artificial intelligence, if it's done properly, is going to be just um, phenomenal for brands. <laughs> 
as customers move online, there's more and more and more data that you can collect on your customers. And yes, there are data privacy issues around that. And so brands have to be good stewards over the data. But if you harness that data tech, uh, that data properly using data science technologies and artificial intelligence, um, the sky is the limit as to um, building efficiencies into your supply chain because you'll be able to predict what your consumers want when they want them. Um, all different types of benefits come from that type of technology, data collection and artificial intelligence. So I don't know if others have thoughts on that point. Oh, and one other thing I want to mention around sustainability, I don't have the book here in my home office right now, but um, I think folks, if you really want to learn deeply about what sustainability is and what it is not, Patagonia, which was like the first brand to ever think about sustainability in retail, um, has a book called The Responsible Company. And it's a really, it's a tiny book, but it's very thought provoking and you know, like what is sustainability? What does that really mean? So I recommend that people read that book. That's really interesting, Gina. And in terms of the AI scanning um, side of things, I mean, we see uh, apps now where you can, you know, scan your feet. So for shoes and footwear, where they can see what footwear is, you know, going to look like on the foot. Um, you know, the objective obviously is to enhance the consumer experience, but also um, to reduce the amount of returns because obviously that has its own issues for, for um, apparel and, and footwear. Um, for me, AI, when asked about fashion law AI, I also turn to the idea of AI for lawyers, um, you know, slightly off a different tangent on that question, but, you know, the future of of you know all of our jobs and all the jobs to come in terms of the industry itself, I think will be um, more and more affected by AI itself, and um, you know how will that shape our careers and the careers to come? Um, I think will be really interesting. I think still got quite a way to go, but it's definitely something else to to think about in terms of commercial awareness and what the future of law, let alone fashion law, looks like. Yeah, Lucy, I think you bring up an amazing point because I think all of this innovation and movement towards technology and fashion is really going to transform the skill set that we as lawyers will need going forward. Um, the perfect example of that with data science being front of mind for a lot of brands is, you know, we have to bone up on data privacy law, you know, we have to be able to advise our clients, hey, you can collect all of this data, but here's what you can and cannot do with it. And it gets really, really complicated. I know in my practice with clients trying to, you know, navigate those landmines and still give the clients um, the kind of business opportunity opportunities that they want. So I think it's it's such a great thing that you've brought up the legal side of it because it is going to change our lives as lawyers. Thank you for that. I mean, it seems as though fashion, um, sustainability and technology is the key movers that we all need to, you know, keep an eye on um, in terms of, you know, what fas the fashion industry has in, um, in store for us in the future. Um, if I can move on to, I guess, you know, seeing as it is International Women's Day, it was International Women's Day on Monday. Um, I think what does being a woman in the legal profession mean to all of you? You know, has there been any positive progress within the profession? And how can many of us either working within or coming into the profession, you know, persevere despite all the barriers? I think there's so much awareness about it. Um, you know, I think we're lucky in the situation that we are now in is, um, you know, for me at least, I'm a junior lawyer and um, I've always been able to find places that I want to work that reflect my values. Um, it's about kind of looking, looking for where you can, um, you know, really enhance your career, but also, um, you know, give back to the firm that you're in. And, you know, in terms of being a woman, I've never... I've never found um, any kind of difficulty in where I've worked. Um, I think those 
kind of tug of wars in terms of um, sometimes balancing home life, uh, work life can be difficult in all areas of law. Um, and that difficulty can get more and more as, as you kind of progress in your career in terms of family commitments and things outside of, of work that you do. Um, but in terms of kind of diversity at work, um, it's really important to be able to find somewhere that you want to work that um, you can be a part of of movement and awareness and at Fox Williams for example I helped run the events for DNI. Um, we had a, a International Women's Day event uh, last week I think Priya it was um, where we heard from different people uh, women within the firm in partnership um, in marketing um, in, in you know, various different roles as to what how their careers have progressed and the challenges that they've faced and it really opened my eyes as to how things have progressed and have moved on and whilst there's still a lot of work to do generally, um, the fashion industry is somewhere that I think is relatively um, you know, balanced in terms of who you're working with, who you're working for, um, and that kind of respect that goes both ways. Thank you. Um, I, I like the point that Lucy just brought up um, to highlight the fact that you know, we do have a choice in where we uh, work. Um, I think that first, being a woman in the legal profession, I personally have seen that there is, in my experience, positive progress in the, in the field, keeping in mind, of course, there's still a long way to go. Uh, women are still largely underpaid when compared to our male counterparts, unfortunately. But at least within um, my practice and my firm, for example, there's been a growing shift and focus on leveling those inequalities, for example. Um, we've been increasingly uh, promoting women in my firm to partnership uh, over the last, you know, I've been there for over eight years now, and I've seen an increasing amount of women become partners, and not just become partners, but also take on executive roles within the firm. Um, I've seen committees being formed uh, to address social injustices, not just uh, to promote the needs and uh, advancement of women, but uh, social injustices. We have a social task force now. We have um, also diversity inclusion. And uh, in terms of um, touching a point upon, up, upon a point that Gina made earlier, a lot of this progress, um, as much as you know, firms have an interest in doing this for you know, their, their employees and to promote their count colleagues and peers, a lot of it does come from external pressures like uh, clients. A lot of clients are now increasingly saying, I want to see an RFP that consists of at least 50% women and 50% of uh, minorities represented in the group that takes on my work. And I promote that. I think that's great. You know, I think um, it needs to be echoed through out, uh, through both both, uh, both the law, law firms as, also, as, uh, as well as the industries and clients because that's the only way that real change will happen. And I see that happening um, you know, within my firm with our clients. And for example, the managing partner of my office is my really good colleague. She's, she's an immigrant, she's female. Um, and it's, it's nice to see that, to see that people of color and, and women can actually run an entire New York office. Uh, consisting of mostly men, actually. So it's interesting. Uh, I think there's a long way to go. And I think, you know, conversations like these with other women in, uh, all over the world really does help to promote that as well. So um, touching upon just one more thing that Lucy said earlier, um, I wanted to remind everyone here to the, you know, if you are looking to get into the legal industry, I do want to rewind, remind, especially women, and this happens to men too, that sometimes you can be vulnerable um, and people can take advantage of the fact that you are looking for employment. Um, just don't feel like you have to uh, take whatever comes at you, you know, first. And also if something doesn't align with you in terms of your ethics or your beliefs, you don't have to sign into that. Um, I understand the pressures uh, that we face now, especially with the pandemic and uh, the lack of um, opportunities, it seems. But I, I really do want to remind everyone that, you know, you don't have to take the first thing that comes because I was in that predicament and I faced some unsavory um, 
uh, interviews, for example, and, you know, these things aren't going to end. So I just want to remind women that, you know, we, we do have to watch out for ourselves, uh, even in the legal profession, unfortunately. So, um, I've been practicing law for a very long time. I am a woman and I am a woman of color. And over my long career, so first of all, I've always practiced both as an engineer and as a lawyer in areas that were white male dominated, 100%. Um, it would be shocking if I walked into a, a conference room and saw a woman in my practice area, it would be shocking if I walked into a courtroom and saw a woman of color. Um, and over the course of my long career, um, I feel that if I've seen discrimination, both personally and with others, it's been more because you're a woman. Um, I can't say that I could put my finger on racial discrimination, although it probably was there, but in my mind, I really didn't care because I knew I was just as smart as everybody else and I just did my job and let my work speak for, for me. Um, but I will say there are some sobering statistics out there when you start looking at the partnership ranks in big law firms. Um, and if you extrapolate that out to partners of color. I'm fortunate to be at an inter international law firm where the chairman of our firm is a woman. It's one of the reasons that um, aside from the tech and fashion practice that I brought my practice here, um, we've got a long way to go, uh, both on the um, racial diversity front and the gender front. Um, and my hope is that some of the events of this last year have opened the minds of our clients and our law firms that there needs to be change. And um, it hasn't happened quickly enough. I, I, I'm just being honest. I've, I've been involved in DNI efforts. I'm on the DNI committee of my firm right now. And you know, every firm I've worked at, they talk about diversity and then you look at the numbers and you think, whoa, this is just not right. So we've got work to do, but I have hope. You know, And I think um, the practice of fashion law is a really unique opportunity for women. Um, I remember when I shared with one of my Silicon Valley colleagues who was also in the high tech space, we were doing complex IP litigation together. When I said, told him I had this idea, he was like, why, what? Like, why would you want fashion? Uh, I mean, he kind of looked down on it, but I think it's a really wonderful opportunity for in which women can practice law and, and, and do well. I, I really, really believe that. Sorry to be a Debbie Downer, but. I'm just giving you the facts. <laughs> okay, cool. I think, um, you know, there's still a long way to go, but there definitely has kind of been some progression in terms of UK statistics anyway. Um, just kind of, I knew this question was coming up, so I was intrigued to have a little research about, um, you know, kind of the percentages of male and female in the legal profession in the UK. Um, and actually, the, the UK Solicitors Regulation Authority website says that women make up 49% of the legal profession, which I was quite interested in. But I think where the difficulty comes in and where you start, um, I guess, yeah, seeing those, I guess, levels um, and differences emerge is in those leadership positions. And I think that's really where, um, you know, where there is a lot of room for improvement. And I think what happens, um, I mean, I'm not a mother um, yet, hopefully, but I'm sure there'll be a time where my prior priorities change and, you know, it's more difficult for me to dedicate more time to my career and women reaching those leadership um, positions, it's sometimes more harder, um, you know, to kind of get past that point because of the, you know, increased demand, increased stress. Um, so I think that's where a lot of work needs to be done in terms of how can 
you um, and companies, um, how can they facilitate women going beyond, um, you know, that that level and kind of reaching those leadership pos positions? And I think hopefully the pandemic has really kind of sped up that movement in terms of flexible working um, and agile hours. I know um, particularly whilst a lot of the schools have been closed here in the UK, Harbottle and Lewis have been incredibly flexible and have just said, you know, as long as you're meeting your minimum billable hours, work whatever hours you need. If you're if you're teaching your kids during the day, then that's fine. Do your work after. Like and it's when you can work when it suits you. And I think hopefully when the pandemic finishes and we go back to the office, I hope that there's still that willingness to um, you know, as women allow us to kind of not make that choice as to whether we want to progress in our career or, you know, make sure that we're there to put our children to bed or, you know, those types of things. And I hope that, that they're not decisions that, you know, I guess I have to make because I think that we should be able to do both, which is obviously what a lot of males do are able to do. So I think that's probably the main challenge is kind of, yeah, reaching those more leadership positions. But I think, um, you know, if I'm ever looking for a job in the future, I think kind of, as everyone's mentioned, the most important thing is doing your research. So I guess, you know, do they have a good diversity and inclusion policy? What were the gender cap, gender um, pay gap reports like? Do they have good f flexible working policies? Um, and it's just those types of questions, I guess, that, you know, you'll gain a lot from during that recruitment process to see whether they're a firm that you think, you know, they are forward thinking. And actually, if they do want you to progress, within you know their um that law firm then they will need to kind of i guess start facilitating those things so i think those type of questions that um you'll need to be asked when you're looking for a job right and and the place to look you can tell right away look at who's in management and look at the partnership yeah. and that will tell you straight away yeah no definitely and i th i think it probably varies you know a lot across different law firms i think I'm lucky in that one of my managers, um, she's an incredible partner. She has twin girls under three. Um, she's very young and I don't know how she's done all of this all at once and it's really inspiring. And she, um, I think is a really good role model for a lot of the um, females in our team because she has, you know, been able to kind of progress her career whilst, you know, having children. She, when we were in the office, she worked a couple of days at home and, and the firm were really happy to kind of facilitate that for her. So I think um, it will just be about, I guess, breaking down those, the norms that have always been in place in terms of, you know, Monday to Friday and, and in law, it's not nine to five. Um, and I hope the pandemic has kind of, I guess, broken down that same old routine that hopefully will allow women to have a bit of a better home home life and work balance. Um, I, um, I agree with um, what Gina said that whilst there has been progress I think there is still a long way to go and I think um, really Sophia what Sophia highlighted in terms of the statistics is that there are there are a huge number of women in law and you see you definitely see that at the junior level um i mean i always find like when i'm working on a transaction majority of the time you know my kind of counterpart on the other side is more often than not is a female um and like i see i do i definitely see at the junior associate level that there are a lot of females i really do think that the issue comes when you get to those kind of more senior positions um whether that's senior associate or whether the you know, direct level or partnership level and i think that's where that's where the issue still is. I mean, in I, I'm kind of quite lucky in our corporate team, we do have three female senior associates um, and, you know, for quite a small team, like, you know, it's good and it's quite nice for me to have that kind of, you know, just to see like that trajectory and to see that, you know, there aren't, there probably possibly aren't going to be those barriers. But I think, again, if you look at the partnership level of a lot of firms, um, it is still very um, male dominated. Um, and I think kind of across the board, it is, again, it's still the kind of the ethnic diversity, I, th I think still isn't there. Um, I think, again, we are making improvements. I mean, I've you know, in the last um, two and a half years since I've been qualified, I have, I have noticed um, kind of significant improvements in terms of diversity. But I think, again, that's all at the junior level. And I think it's going to take quite a long time before that kind of like 
you know, filters up to you know, you know the top kind of leadership positions. Um, and I think that is what's going to be really important to kind of like to keep this um, to keep this conversation going um, going forward because you really do need um, that kind of that buy in from from the top level. Really, um, I do think that you know there there are some kind of huge benefits of the pandemic because I think it really has kind of accelerated. Um, agile working for everyone I think um, a lot of firms did have agile working policies but it's kind of how how much were they put into practice before before this come before we were kind of like thrown into the situation where they had to be um accepted I think you know like like you were saying Sophia I think people being able to kind of you know you know work the hours that suit them you know, so you know they have got a commitment you know they have got you know they have to pick up their kids from school or they've got other commitments um outside of work they can do that and then you know they can fit their hours around that I think hopefully that is something that will continue but again I think that is something that's kind of it's going to take a conscious effort um for that to continue because I think it is quite easy to slip back into um old like habits um you know and you know there is the possibility that you know when everyone does return to the office it it does kind of go back to that kind of norm where you are expected to be there between the hours for argument's sake let's say like nine to five although we all know as, as always it's a lot more than that but I think it you know it, it does take um all of us to kind of to keep you know to keep kind of driving towards having that you know more agile working which may be beneficial for I think it's beneficial for everyone but I think in particular I think women will see the benefits of that um and I also think kind of like as like women within the profession you know there's a lot that we can do to kind of support each other as well I think a lot of a lot of you know there, there will be women I imagine kind of in more senior positions than me that have you know have found it more difficult to get there and you know I'm sure there's a lot of you know knowledge that can be shared and support that can be given in that way as well so I think um I think it is kind of a universal responsibility to kind of keep the conversation going but also to kind of to really kind of you know put those things into practice as well um just just to support women going forward so that you know so that you know in you know, in five or ten years time when we're having this conversation again we actually are seeing kind of more women in those senior leadership roles um which i think is what everyone really is is striving for thank you all of you i mean just thinking that so obviously in terms of like the route that i'm going into into the legal profession i'm coming from going to the bar route so i don't know those with outside of the uk so in the UK, we have two types of lawyers, so solicitors and barristers, and I'm following the barrister route. And I know personally, in terms of just how the bar is for females or aspiring female barristers going in there, it is really, really hard. It's still, see, it's still seen as this, you know, pale, stale, male-dominated um, career, uh, you know, that's just really, really hard to get into. Um, and I think one of the things I think Gina was saying um, that I really resonated with is when I went to a previous um, event, I um, can't remember what the subject was about, but they were like, you know, when you want to apply for these chambers, you know, doing pupillages and stuff, you know, look at the composition of those chambers, like how many of the barristers are females, how many of them are ethnic minorities, and you know, that will just tell you all you need to know about of that particular chambers. I mean, even when Sophia was giving, you know, the statistics, I don't know if it includes like the bar statistics um, in those as well. But I do know that it is still like a long way to go. I mean, we have made progress. I know last year was a really big year for female barristers within the UK who were appointed as QCs. You know, it was an overwhelming amount of them who um, were appointed as QCs and it kind of just showed, you know, at the bar level, things were moving on the up. You know, there was um, the consideration of female barristers in those senior leadership roles. Um, I mean, and that's all well and good, but like you've all said, there is, a lot of work that just has to be done you know in maintaining those and helping those who are coming into the profession as well feel welcomed um in the legal profession you know as a whole i mean i don't know if anyone wants to add anything onto that before we move to the q a section i'm just going to say that one of the issues that i think faces solicitors um or solicitors but solicitor firms 
um, at least in the UK, I don't know if it's the same in the States, but um, is this issue of people, women um, and men moving in house um, for different kind of balance of work life kind of uh, pressures. Um, I do wonder whether this push on flexible working perhaps might um, provide for a more flexible route to continue in law firms rather than sometimes um, it can be seen that if you work in-house, you can have a little bit more flexibility in terms of your, your hours. Um, that's not always the case. It completely will depend on where you're working. But um, I do wonder whether the, whether the pandemic will change how the progression for women and men um, in law firms and it will turn out in a few years time if, if trends that are kind of in place now continue. Yeah, definitely agree with that. I think like all of you have mentioned in terms of the pandemic, it has been an eye opener in terms of the way we work. You know, working habits have definitely shifted, I think for the best in most cases. And it has given, you know, a great degree of flexibility in terms of how we share out our hours. Um, especially for those who have children, you know, where we've had to, where they've had to basically teach children at home and still, you know, dedicate time to doing the work that they need to do. I think moving forward, you know, I think working culture will definitely change. Um, I am aware that some UK firms have definitely already just changed the way that, um, they require their lawyers to do certain work, you know, maybe they don't require them to come into the office five days a week, you know, it could be split between, I don't know, three days at home and two in the office or vice versa. Um, so I think the pandemic has definitely um, changed a lot of things for how women work within the legal profession. And hopefully, you know, it will be maintained and there will be, you know, a greater change moving forward. Um, so that like Priya said, when we do come to have these discussions, you know, in the future, you know, we can confidently say like, you know, this is happening, you know, there has been a great change and that all women who are coming into the legal profession can feel accepted, you know, and work their way up into these senior positions. So I think we're really good for time. Um, so we might be able to squeeze in a few Q and A's, you know, than we've already scheduled. So I think we'll move to the Q and A section. Um, before we start, I do want to say thank you to everyone who did submit questions. Um, there was a lot of questions. Um, so if it's your question isn't read out, doesn't mean that, you know, it's not here. It means either it's a repeat of somebody else's question or there's just not enough time. So what we've decided is to do a follow up blog post um, answering the questions that we don't answer in the Q&A um, segment. So, you know, don't worry if it's not read out or if it's not answered right now in the webinar, it will be definitely answered um, in a follow up blog post. Um, also, we've I've actually divided divided the questions into three categories so you know ones to do with education career and then industry specific questions and then other questions that don't fall into the two you know categories so if I make a start on the education category and I will just read them out um it will be um, your names won't be called out so it will be anonymous um so nobody will be identified um so with the first one um and this is to all the speakers. Uh, what was your undergraduate experience like? What motivated or inspired you to become a fashion lawyer? How did you realize that this was your niche? And any advice on um, any advice pursuing pursuing a fashion law degree that you wish you had known before? Would you like me to kick off? Yeah. Sure, okay. Um, so undergraduate-wise, I did um, a law degree with French law at the uh, University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, I, it was an LLB, so then I, uh, I had a year out, um, during which I, I worked as an intern, a legal intern at a, at a company called Veolia. Um, and then uh, law school was a kind of accelerated six-month LPC. Um, in terms of what inspired me or um, how did I realise um, I want to do fashion law? Um, I guess in terms of obviously what everyone's already said, but for me, I guess my particular role, um, I, I love the idea of helping um, brands, agents, distributors, manufacturers, suppliers, 
kind of being able to grow or being able to put their product to market, um, you know, setting up the commercial contracts. Um, by way of example, most of January or so, I was working on a, a joint venture collaboration agreement with a, um, a luxury clothing brand, um, which involved you know, working with so many different types of lawyers in our firm. And that for me um, is one of the perks, I think, of being a, a fashion lawyer, because as we said earlier, that fashion law really does cover so many different types of legal areas. You're often working with people across different um, disciplines and that can kind of keep your job really varied. I'd say, you know, it's really key to find something that you're interested in, but that will continue to challenge you. you for me, I'd never want to do the same thing day in, day out. Um, and fashion law, you most definitely will not be doing the same thing day in, day out, let alone you know, in years to come. So. Um, so I did um, a, a non-law um, undergraduate degree. I did international business and Spanish. And really, and up until my training contract, most of my work experience was more um, kind of business focused. Um, I worked in business development um, for a while. Um, and then before I started my training contract, um, I worked at, at Goldman Sachs, kind of in the kind of compliance reg um, division there. Um, and really for me, I think, like I said before, I always had an interest in fashion. Um, as a corporate lawyer, I, I, it's, you know, it's not the only um, sector focus that I have, but I knew that I wanted it to be one of the sector focuses. Um, so, and yeah, really kind of for me, I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do just because that I had um, kind of a personal interest in that area. Um, but in terms of kind of, uh, yeah, degree in that, and kind of a further education, um, there wasn't anything specific I did. It was more kind of um, just, yeah, Look, you know, attending events and industry knowledge and I'd say kind of my secondment at Arcadia was something that kind of really was what persuaded me that this was an area that I really kind of wanted to focus on. Um, I think I touched upon, I guess, my background earlier. Um, I went to undergraduate, uh, in, I went to a college studying political science and then I ended up working at an IP law firm as paralegal. And it was there that I realized I wanted to get into law. And that's basically how I fell into IP. And it was only through my externships and internships that I realized I really did enjoy working with uh, fashion brands and designers. So um, I think it's some people, it, they know from the beginning and others just kind of fall into it after having some experience either in coursework or in uh, working in-house. Um, so I, that's been my personal experience. I think is Sophia um, Gina there? Yeah, so I alluded to this earlier, so I'll just give you the condensed version. Um, my undergraduate degree, I attended the University of Colorado. I'm from Colorado here in the United States. Um, my undergraduate degree was in mathematics and computer science. I worked as a computer software engineer in industry for 10 years, decided to go to law school. I attended law school at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. I chose that school because um, it was a top 25 law school here in the States and they had one of the best IP programs in the nation. So I already had it in my mind that I would be IP focused. Um, and then, as I said earlier, I practiced in Silicon Valley, having nothing to do with um, fashion at all for 14 years, doing complex IP litigation and um, on topics, you know, semiconductor software, uh, optical technology, all kinds of things, nothing to do with fashion. And I, you know, because of my mom, uh, who is near and dear to my heart. I always had it in the back of my head that um, fashion was something interesting. And if I'm being brutally honest, the reason I took the direction I did with fashion tech is because no, none of the guys in the firm I was working at were even thinking about it. And I felt like if I'm going to, at the time I was senior counsel on the verge of um, partnership, 
and in order to build a practice and be um, self-sustaining and promote through the firm, I knew I had to do something that, well, I wanted to do something that nobody else was doing. So that's how I got here. Um, yeah, I think I talked a little bit about my undergrad experience before, but I guess um, when I was at university, I wasn't really sure, well, firstly, what areas of law there were in that, you know, you obviously do your key modules, but um, there was also options such as medical law, um, you know, and other like environmental law. I think you kind of are learning about the different areas that you can potentially specialize in. I think at that point, I just tried to get involved in as much as I can, uh, as much as I could um, in terms of, I guess, legal experience, but also non-legal experience. I think um, one of the most valuable things I did at university was the pro bono project, um, which obviously was more like criminal law, but I think obviously when you progress, those skills are really transferable. Um, but I think, as well as the legal experience, I think the best thing that I did at um, university as well was just kind of getting inv as involved as I could with different societies. Because when it comes to applications, particularly in the UK, it's a lot of very competency-based questions. Um, so to you know have been able to use a variation of skills and have a bit of experience behind you on top of obviously your academic studies, um, I think is you know what's really beneficial and I think that was kind of the basis of my undergrad experience in obviously trying to get a law degree but also trying to become a, a well-rounded applicant I guess um but following on from that I guess that's where um you know the speciality began and I think kind of as we've touched on um I think something that I've realized in hindsight is that actually a legal background in becoming particularly, um, you know, a media and entertainment lawyer um, isn't, you know, always the all and end all. And actually some of the best lawyers that we've had, um, you know, probably like, like you, Gina, and that, you know, you've got a very um, in-depth industry understanding of particular sectors, um, which, you know, is something that as a lawyer, you can't always learn. Um, obviously the legal side of things, you can do the training, teach us that but having that in-depth industry knowledge um, is what's really important I think kind of post degree that was something that I really focused on um, and worked in-house um, it was actually in a television company but I think just kind of understanding a little bit more about how um, you know the industry works in, in practice was really important um, and yeah I think kind of the combination of those creative industries and the legal side of things um, is kind of what led me to this area and I um, yeah, I'm really grateful that there is still some, you know, really interesting creative parts of my role, even though, you know, um, I'm not the one doing the creative work. I think kind of as um, Lucy and um, Priya mentioned, it's just really nice to, you know, see those projects that you've worked on, you've helped, and then obviously you see the end result. And it's really great to be a part of that. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have here is, I do a master's in intellectual property law, textile. Can I still have access to jobs in the fashion law industry? What is a good academic profile in the fashion law field? If, for example, which masters or what to do in, um, what to do in an internship in? So I don't know who wants to take this particular question. Are they asking about an internship, a legal internship, or an internship in-house, or does it matter? Um, they haven't been specific. All um, they've just said is they do a master's. They're currently doing a master's in intellectual property law, um, specifically within textiles. Um, and I guess they just want to know, you know, what jobs can they have access to within fashion law and, you know, what internships could they do? Um, well, first of all, I think getting that degree in both IP and textiles is amazing. I think that's like a wonderful start. Um, I mean, you can certainly intern in-house at a, a, a fashion company. Uh, here in the States, we don't take in, let me think about this. We don't take in um, folks who 
don't have uh, some level of leg legal education, like right now we're doing a TIP program for first year law students. So law students <clears throat> want to practice in the technology sector, sector and the IP. And then we have our normal um, uh, summer associate programs. But I would say to this person, I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but I think they're off to a wonderful start. And um, I would just, you know, if you can get an internship at a firm and learn IP on a more uh, hands-on basis, or you can do it in-house at a company, either one works, but the start sounds really encouraging to me. And, you know, any other speakers who want to, you know, add on to that, please do feel free. I was going to say that here in the UK, I often see fashion brands advertising for um, paralegals. Um, it's, you know, entry, kind of entry level um, job here in the UK. Um, it can turn into a career of itself or it can be used as a stepping stone. Um, being able to try and identify opportunities like that, you know, they're, they're not common, but I have seen a few pop up relatively recently. Um, you know, tools like LinkedIn can be really helpful for things like that. Um, so keeping an eye on, on any opportunity that comes up and acting quickly, I think, is probably the, the best way to go about it. Thank you. And Alice, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, I agree with Gina. I think uh, having a master's in intellectual property law, especially textile, is definitely helpful if you're trying to uh, procure a position in the fashion law industry. That being said, it's not necessary. So... Um, I think it's just being resourceful as well. Like Lucy said, to just keep an eye on uh, certain companies, like you follow certain companies on LinkedIn, that's helpful too, just to get uh, maybe some insight that might not be advertised yet. There's an opening or, you know, sometimes these companies, they promote uh, initiatives that they have that might actually um, be something that's advantageous to you if later on there's, a, there's an opening that comes up and you've already known about that. So you can show how you've been following and are keeping a focus and eye on that company. And you can be uh, someone that's more appealing in terms of uh, a hire. So I echo um, my colleague's sentiments here. That's great. And I mean, just linking onto that, um, one of the questions here is from someone who's a first year student in their, you know, law degree. And obviously as a first year law student, you know, having access to these sort of work experiences is quite limiting because I guess you must be at least, well, I know here in the UK, um, to get any, <clears throat> sorry, to get any sort of, you know, work experience, um, at least you must be in your second year of your law degree. Um, so from someone who is in their first year of their law degree, what um, is out there for them that they can do to be able to just get that experience? Um. I just want to say if you're in your first year, I think you should really focus on academics. I don't think you should really um, focus on procuring a position at that point because at least in the US, first year, the first year academic, your grades really matter in terms of on-campus interviews. And I promote, you know, to the extent you can get work, you should, but I, I do think that the, um, first year law students shouldn't stress themselves out in getting a position, not saying that you shouldn't try to get one if you can, but I think the main focus is just to make sure that you are doing well academically so that you can set yourself up to get that first summer internship and then your externships throughout the next semesters. So my approach or my opinion is slightly different. I don't think you have to take a draconian approach to all of this. I do agree that grades are paramount, especially at big firms. They look at where you go to school and what your grades are. So you should never sacrifice uh, grades. But as I mentioned just a moment ago, you know, there are firms like ours. We are going to be starting in just a couple of weeks a um, an internship program for first years who are interested in practicing uh, technology in technology law. And so there are opportunities uh, out there like that. You can even get those types of opportunities at big companies, you know? Um, and I think, I think it's not a bad idea because look, it's very competitive 
and the more you can differentiate yourself, the better. So if all of your classmates didn't have a, an internship after your first year, then I would hustle and I would try and get an internship. Yes, I'd keep my grades up, but it's all about standing out in the pack. And I do recruitment here at the firm. So I see lots of resumes and interview lots of law students. And, um, you know, you always want to see someone's resume who was hustling and who really um, just went for it. And so that's what I would recommend. And I wouldn't let people tell you no. Like sometimes you just have to really be persistent and you have to be resourceful. And there are just so many opportunities out there. You just got to go for them. I, I agree with that completely. Um, when I was at university, so I did a four-year degree. So um, in my second year summer, um, I wanted to do some work experience and um, ended up writing to a lot of different companies to try and you know, see if anyone would take me on for a couple of weeks. I ended up working at a, a pharmaceutical company, which was brilliant. It was, you know, in-house experience. Um, and it gave me something to talk about at interviews because, you know, everyone's coming through uh, sometimes all talking about perhaps uh, in practice um, vacation schemes or things like they've done or even you know any kind of scheme that law firms are putting on you want to be able to have something that is different um, something that you're you enjoyed and you're passionate about and you can talk to and it will make people remember you uh, you know as against 20 other applicants that they're interviewing that day um, it's, it's really key to try and find something whether it be legal non-legal business a different type of masters um, or just a course that you can go on. I mean, there's so much opportunity out there and just setting yourself apart will do you so much good for uh, getting the jobs themselves. I, yeah, I definitely agree with what, um, what Lucy just said. I think um, kind of expanding your search and not just like not just focusing on legal. I mean, obviously legal work experience is, you know, it is really useful, um, but not limiting yourself to just legal work experience because I think there's so much you can learn um, from working elsewhere as well um, and it can also obviously it just helps you to understand I think you know how companies operate better and I think it kind of obviously it gives you a lot more to talk about um, in your kind of in your interviews when you when you get to that stage um, I think that I did find that actually I found my non-legal work experience was actually a lot more useful um, in when I was when I came to kind of the interview stage then actually the legal work experience I had because well not only was I doing kind of you know more of more of a role in um, those non-legal um, um, employment experiences I had it would it just kind of it gave it a different angle and I was able to kind of speak about you know the role of the business as well as, well as the role of them um, of the lawyer so I think it is kind of a case of not limiting yourself because it can be difficult um, to get um, legal work experience outside of you know the traditional vacation scheme so I think it's just really important to um, yeah, look, look elsewhere as well. I'll just add to that by saying that um, I think as well, I guess, you know, particularly as a first year student, there's probably, you know, an element where it's obviously really hard to get that first set of work experience and to try and, I guess, get the ball rolling in terms of, um, you know, you need experience to get work experience and stuff like that. But I think um, maybe, you know, some things that first year students can concentrate on are attending events like this um, and, you know, reading around the subject that you're interested in, going to different webinars and talks. And a lot of law firms do open days, you go to open days and you know, there's other ways that you can demonstrate your um, passion and interest in, you know, sectors and law firms and law in itself. And I think kind of what Lucy said, as long as in the interview, you know you're interesting and you're able to demonstrate one why you're applying there and two what area of law you're interested in there's lots of ways that you can do that obviously work experience is um you know the best one but i think um you know by being able to talk about industry trends and which we've kind of done a lot of today by attending these events i think um you know work experience isn't always the big one and all, particularly that first spout of work experience when you're just still a student and really trying to get off the ground Thank you. Um, our next question is, um, I'm applying to convert from a humanities PhD, so languages and fashion history, to law via the GDL, and I'm hoping to specialise in fashion law. Do you have any advice um, to strengthen my training contract applications? 
I think with something like this, it's, it's it, I guess, has some parallels with when I, I moved uh, practice areas. So I had to demonstrate why I wanted to move from a finance role into a commercial role. Um, as you'll, you'll need to kind of be able to explain, you know, the reason for your move and being able to think that through in terms of, um, you know, where you're moving, the things that you can bring with you in terms of skill set um, and being able to demonstrate that you have an awareness of what it is that you're moving into and you're committed to that, I, I think are more things you should try and weave into your the training contract application and then uh, your subsequent interviews. Does anyone have anything else to add to that? Um, I think probably just what we mentioned before in that I think really you just need to have enough um, information about the sector that you're moving into to be able to convince that recruiter that, you know, you are genuinely interested in that, in, in that area and that, you know, you'll be an asset to their team because of the transferable skills that you already have. So I think... Um, yeah, really, it's just, you know, I guess having a better understanding of the role that you'll be moving into in that area and just making sure that you've got the right information to back that up and to be able to convince the recruiter ultimately. Thank you. So I, I'm feeling compelled to, to share this and it's more of a um, less of a legal and more a psychological and interpersonal thing. And it has certainly helped me over the course of my career. Um, what I think you find with women, professional women and non-professional women, frankly, is we sell ourselves short a lot of the time. Um, we confine ourselves in ways that we really should not. And so my advice to folks is to be bold, really be bold. Um, I don't listen to rap music, but I am aware of a rap song that has a quote in it that I use often. And it, it's um, our greatest, en my greatest enemy is my inner me. And I think about that all the time. You know, sometimes we get in our own way and we let people tell us what we can and can't do. And so my advice to um, people would just be, be bold, go for whatever you want, be bold and don't let people tell you no. Cause there's always a yes somewhere around the corner. Thank you, Gina. I mean, that's really, really wise words there. And I hope everyone, you know, takes so much from what Gina and the rest of the ladies um, have shared with that question, um, with um, that particular question. I think with the education side, I think a lot of things have been discussed in the actual main body of the webinar and as well. So we've kind of, you know, moved on to the career section of the questions. Um, the first one being, um, what advice do you have for someone new to the industry or someone trying to enter this practice area? How did you find your niche in fashion law? How has the industry changed since you started? And what has been your biggest success factor so far? I don't know who wants to kickstart that one off. Um, I, I think in connection with the question about how has the industry changed so far, I recall when I was um, just a paralegal, internet law was just uh, starting. So um, like the Ebays of the world were just starting to, uh, or rather companies were having issues with Ebay, for example, in selling of either fakes or just goods that were not legitimate, uh, that were infringing. And when I was in, um, when I was a paralegal, there weren't necessarily case law and other ways that uh, companies were able to protect themselves. And then I went to law school and that's when I, um, there was a whole new class on internet law and we're talking about now there's a DMCA for takedown. So law has really changed and it's going to have to continue to change, you know, in connection with a lot of the change uh, with the evolution of fashion in terms of technology, like what Sophia said about LVMH, like licensing their their marks and their fashion for use in connection with electronic games. Uh, I just think that there's going to be a continuing change in, and there's going to have to be a uh, response to that change because there's going to be there's going to be need to be new enforcement measures and other things that will arise from just these partnerships. And um, 
Uh, so I, I think that's one of the interesting aspects of working in fashion law that it's pivoting and it's always, it's not static. And um, it does involve a lot of, um, I guess, uh, anticipation of what will happen down the line. Um, and uh, for someone new going into the industry, um, the advice I have is just be plugged in to the industry itself. Like Gina mentioned, it's very important to know your audience and your clients and their business very well. So I would, you know, those, those are my, my two cents. Um, yeah, I would just again echo what Alice said that I think if for someone coming into the, the, you know, the fashion sector, I think it is just really important to kind of you know, increase your knowledge and like, you know, at, you know, attend events where you can, but also to, you know, sign up to updates, you know, do your own kind of research around the area and, you know, look at where, you know, where you might see certain trends emerging or where you can, you know, where you can see things moving in a certain direction. I think it is just important to kind of keep on top of it and kind of don't, you know, don't always wait for things to, the updates to come your way. I think, you know, doing your own research and like being really proactive in terms of um, how you get to, to know the sector. Um, I think also, you know, it's important to kind of remember that fashion businesses are, you know, they are a lot like other businesses. So, you know, there are other things you can look at as well that might help you understand how a fashion business works and kind of, you know, what, you know, what you might need to do um, you know, to help you kind of, you know, you know advise um, a client. So I think there's just a lot of, um, a lot of your kind of own research you can do to help you get to know the, the you know, practice area a lot better. So I think a really good subscription is the Business of Fashion, which is out of the UK. Um, that's a great thing to subscribe to. Um, uh, there's some, uh, there are some other online US-based fashion law newsletters that you can subscribe to. There's some really great conversations going on on Clubhouse. If folks um, offshore know what clubhouse is um, so do that um, just become a sponge and learn as much as you can about the industry and also I I and I I, I don't say this because I'm uh, you know um, plugging Susan Scafitti's uh, Fashion Law Institute but I found taking the boot camp courses that the two that I took so helpful because they bring in um, industry folks to talk to you and um, just by way of example when I took the fashion tech boot camp course in Silicon Valley we actually got to go inside of Apple which never happens it's such a closed system and we got to talk to the team of lawyers who uh, worked on the Apple watch so just take opportunities thank you um, if anyone hasn't got anything to add on, I'll move to the next question. Um, and it's, what was the most challenging aspect of your career so far? And how did you overcome it? Um, how family friendly is a career in fashion law? And when you have family commitments, is working in-house better than working for a law firm, for example? Okay, so I can address that really quickly. I don't want to optimize the conversation, but um, when I was working at an engineer at a company here in Southern California and was thinking about going to law school, I actually um, spoke to one of the patent attorneys in the legal department. I just cold called him because I wanted to know, like, what do patent attorneys do? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Um, and as a result of that cold call, a couple of things happened. One, I got recruited into the legal department. I moved from my engineering um, division into corporate and I worked in the um, in-house. Um, and so I got to see the private, the private firm side of things over the course of my career and in-house. Um, but the advice that I would give, in fact, I just gave it to a law student yesterday. Um, at least here in the States, it may be different um, elsewhere, but you want to go to a law school. You want, like, if you're looking for internship opportunities, you know, working in-house is fine, but once you get your legal education, the advice that was given to me, and it was the best advice in the world, is go work at a law firm 
because working at a law firm is the equivalent for lawyers uh, of an internship and residency for medical students. And you really learn how to be a good, good lawyer. There is no replacement for it. It is painful. It is long hours. There are times when you scratch your head and ask like, what the heck? Why did I ever decide to do this? And I bet if we're all being honest, we've had those moments probably within the last week. Um, and then once you get like four or five years experience in, then you can start going in-house. But I can tell you here in the States, in-house positions are just as rigorous as, you know, in terms of the number of hours you work as, as uh, working at firm, but that's my two cents worth. I agree with Gina wholeheartedly. And um, I have spoken to friends who have gone in-house and they actually think that it's a little, it's more rigid being in-house um, in terms of hours because I can't speak for everyone else, but at least within my firm, I have the flexibility of finishing my work after dinner at home. If you're working in a corporation, they expect you in the office, not from nine to five, but from nine to whenever they decide to leave, right? In many ways. And one of them worked, one of my good friends worked at a fashion brand uh, in-house and she, she was amazed that she had to put in more hours physically in the office. And when you're sitting there in-house, you don't just have legal demands. You have people from marketing, people from uh, the retail stores calling in because something happened. Things will always arise that is going, that is going to prevent you from necessarily handling the task that you have for the day. So you, I think there's, um, there's a uh, myth that the, the in-house professional uh, has a nine to five, but in actuality, that's not always the case. And sometimes it's a, a lot more um, demanding because you're not able to even get to the work you need to do as a lawyer. And you're getting paid less, right? <laughs> yeah, so you're getting let's, paid less. Let's, let's mention that. <laughs> and you don't have the resources necessarily too. You know, you know, in a law firm, they set you up for success. So if something's wrong with a printer, someone will come there in this instant to fix that printer. But if you're working in-house at a company, sometimes things like that, you, you're just going to have to figure it out on your own. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think generally, um, as a lawyer, I think the work life balance thing is always going to be quite tricky, no matter if you're kind of in private practice, or if you are in house. But um, yeah, I, I would um, agree with what with what Alice said. I mean, I'm, obviously, my in house experience is quite limited. But I would say that my hours weren't, you know, hugely different to what they were, you know, when I was, when I've been in private practice, I think um, you do have a lot of conflicting demands on your time, because you are kind of, um, you are a legal advisor to kind of everyone in the business. So um, it's not necessarily um, going to be kind of um, an easier route or, you know, or the route where, you know, you'll be working less. I think it is quite, um, I think, it, and it's becoming more so as well. I think it's becoming quite balanced in terms of hours, but um, as Gina and Alice said, it's not so balanced in terms of, um, yeah, the resources that you have access to and yeah, not necessarily in the pay either. But I think, um, I think you've really got to look at it in terms of, you've got to look at your motivations for kind of either working in private practice or in-house. I think there are obviously huge benefits to uh, working in-house because, you know, you do become, I, 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 you know, I think you do become a bit more of an all-rounded kind of business advisor and you obviously do really get to know a business. And I think it, it does kind of change the way that you operate. But I think, yeah, you really have to look at your motivations for either option. And I think, um, unfortunately, I don't think kind of um, work-life balance is, is, is guaranteed and um, yeah, either way. I, I agree it's not guaranteed, but um, I think it completely depends on where you work, both in terms of law firm, in terms of the area, um, in terms of the business that you want to work in-house. I've worked in-house twice um, so far uh, in my career, you know, at kind of entry-level positions. Um, both times my work-life balance was better than the majority of the different legal practice areas I've worked in, um, but they're not no, no no better than some of the others if, if uh, you follow. But um, I think it it depends. It depends on what you want to do, kind of long term. Do you want to go into in house and then go back to private practice in order to have, try and get some industry um, experience, which often happens at kind of the more junior end. Um, but you know, as Priya said, the way of working in private practice 
usually is a very broad kind of um, view. You might have a couple of different matters on in your week. Um, for me, it's a bit different. Commercial and Sophia perhaps um, has this experience that maybe I'm working on 10 different things in my day. It's a little bit more kind of a in-house style of working because you've got multiple kind of different things going on at the same time. Uh, whereas normally in private practice, if you're kind of working on one or two things in the week, that would be relatively uh, the way that it goes. Um, and then in-house, you've got this to-do list, which will never end. Uh, you'll never quite get to the bottom of it. You have to be comfortable with that. You have to be able to work kind of in a non-structured way and be able to jump on things if they come up or you know turn your attention to something else that becomes more urgent. It's kind of about managing that as a rolling process rather than in private practice, you generally are brought in to produce some kind of work deliverable that you package up nicely for your client and provide that and then perhaps some kind of follow-up. So it's just a com completely different types of working uh, and it will depend on the area that you're working in and the business or law firm that you're working in as well. Yeah, I think just following on from that, um, I think, yeah, I, I've worked in-house for a total of two years um, and I think the job satisfaction is very different between working um, in private practice and working in-house. And I find working at Harbottle and Lewis, obviously we're ultimately a service provider. So clients obviously instruct us to provide a service. So we are, you know, putting our best foot forward and giving the best service that we can give. So the work that I send to clients, I've had time to make sure that, you know, I feel like it's you know, everything's in order, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, whereas I felt in-house, um, often a lot of the commercial team, um, you know, like you said, Lucy, they're coming to you from all angles. And sometimes I felt like legal was a bit of a burden for them and a bit of a tick box exercise. And actually legal, the legal team um, was seen as like a, you know, like a support staff to the commercial team. Um, you know people in in the team um and yeah it was, it was quite an interesting dynamic and I think sometimes I did feel like when I was doing my job which was you know proof checking things and ultimately sometimes finding issues in I guess in a law firm you know you're like oh good job it's really good we spotted that we can make sure we advise the client properly whereas actually in-house the response to that was oh like particularly with some of the marketing stuff I was doing it's like well actually we've already paid for the billboards to be printed and if you if there's a marketing issue we're going to have to weigh up the risk of you know potentially cancelling this order um and you know what the potential liabilities could be and I found that a bit frustrating maybe particularly more like a junior level where um I want everything to be at a really good standard and kind of taking a view on that commercial risk I wasn't maybe yet comfortable with um but I also yeah it did kind of like you said, Lucy, just had a long list of stuff to do and I didn't feel like I could always give my attention to each thing as it I felt like it deserved. So Thank I can you. tell you, I can tell you as a partner, I have 20,000 things pulling me in 20,000 different directions every single day. And I cannot recall a time in the last year when I ticked off everything on my to-do list. And typically I have all these things on my to-do list and then I come in and the to-do list was 20 in the morning and it's 50 by the middle of the day. So, um, yeah, it just, you know, as Lucy said, it depends, you know, where you are, what you're doing, what level you are, all of that. And then to Sophie's point about frustrations working in-house, and you even see this when you're dealing with clients at a firm. Um, when I was in-house, uh, the vice president and chief general counsel, everybody's boss, the guy at the very top, I remember we had a meeting and he said something that has never left my memory. He said, uh, he was talking about how we service the different business groups in the in the company and he said our job is not to say no our job is how to figure out a yes that gets them what they need and keeps them out of legal trouble so i try to do that in my practice and i mean just sticking on to the in-house stuff someone has asked 
you know, do you think it's possible to pivot into fashion law role from a very different industry? So kind of currently they're in an in, in-house um, within sports. Um, I think, I guess, um, um, maybe Lucy, like you agree. I think actually, if um, obviously depending on what I guess, legal department in sport the individuals in, I think um, you know a lot of us probably do other sector work as well. So I have um, you know another speciality in film and TV, and actually you know a lot of the um, legal side of contracts you know are very similar and actually it's the subject matter that is different so in terms of transferring between commercial areas I don't think that's too much of an issue and um, the skills are similar it's just obviously making sure that you can demonstrate that they're transferable obviously if the legal sector is very different um, then you know that might be a bit a bit more difficult but I think um, yeah particularly in commercial law you know, a lot of us bounce between various sectors um, and often, yeah, like I say, the legalities of the contract, the skeletons are very similar. It's just the subject matter that's different. And obviously that industry experience can really help um, like tailor those agreements. Yeah, I agree with that, Sophia, completely. I mean, we do tech work as well in our team and, you know, the same foundations are there across various different um, industries in terms of the documentation that you're papering for clients. I mean, if you look at people that study law, if you take it back kind of before people enter the profession, you know, so many law students end up doing various different things because the skills that you learn as, as a law student or as on your GDL or on the equivalents everywhere else in the world are transferable. And that's the best thing I think about our career or for myself, that is the best thing because you can turn your mind to different things. It's being able to pick up where, you know, perhaps you've seen something in a different industry that can be transferred into something else that you're working on to the advantage of the client um, and being able to demonstrate why you want to change is always really important um, no matter whether you're going into a different area of law or industry showing that interest is is key which I know everyone's been speaking about this evening and I think we would all agree that it makes you a better lawyer the more exposure you get to different types of things you may not have a specialty in a particular area. But if you know enough about it that you can issue spot it and then hand it off to um, someone else in your firm I mean that is just so critical you're just a better lawyer I had an experience just recently last week in fact. Um, I was working on an IP license agreement for. Um, um, one of my UK colleagues, um, and I was looking at the agreement and I thought, whoa, wait a minute, there's a tax issue here, but I'm not getting my, my foot in that pond. So I immediately called one of our tax experts and he got on the phone with the client, was able to give the client advice, but you know, it was helpful. I've been on enough calls with our tax lawyers that I kind of understand a little bit of the gibberish that they talk. And so I knew enough that I didn't know enough and I needed an expert, so. Um, I think, yeah, Gina, I think that's a really actually important point is like um, having kind of um, knowledge kind of across different sectors, even, you know, at a very high level, is actually really, really important because you really do need to know when something needs to be looked at by a specialist. So, I mean, I, you know, whereas I do work in the fashion sector, um, as I mentioned earlier, I do, um, I also work kind of in the publishing sector and in the tech sector. And it really varies kind of deal to deal, kind of, um, you know, what kind of specialist advice we'll need from our, you know, from our commercial team or employment team um, or, you know, other, other areas of the firm. And I think um, it is just really important knowing when you, do you need to get that specialist advice in? And I think as, you know, as a junior lawyer working on, you know, any matter, you do really need to just kind of look at something and be able to identify, like, actually, this is going to be a big issue because this is the type of company that I'm working for. And say, obviously, you know, if you're working for a fashion brand, you know, if they, you know, if it looks to be that there might be a particular issue with IP, you know, whether that's, you know, because they haven't registered something or whether it's because, you know, one of their employees, you've looked at the employment contract kind of like in your due diligence process and you're like, I'm actually not sure, you know, if the, you know, if all of the, the IP actually has been assigned to the employer, and you you do need to know when when you can make a call on it, and 
or when you you know or when that last kind of needs to be handed over and I think it is really important like, as you know, said like to know enough about something to know that you actually really do need to get someone else involved and I think that is kind of one benefit of working across different sectors so I think you know you don't have to necessarily kind of you know you know narrow your focus too much especially at a junior level I think it can be really helpful to you know have a you know a breadth of um, knowledge across different areas. And uh, to piggyback off what Priya said it's true um, and one of one I remember my first year of uh, a senior partner would always have me sit in on calls with other partners from other groups which also highlights the importance of working for a law firm because when you work for a law firm, you can actually hear from specialists in different areas of the law. And I, that was how I was able to realize, oh, this might touch upon a tax issue, like what Gina said, or this is probably something the corporate guys should look at. Because when you hear the dialogue amongst um, colleagues from different practice areas, you then start to pick up on things that you should be aware of when you're looking at uh, things for your own clients. If it's just with respect to IP, then you see, okay, this might actually um, involve a specialist in another field. Thank you all. I mean, I'm just quite conscious of the time. Um, so I think we'll move on to like industry specific questions. Um, and the first is with the consistent rise of social media influencers and fashion um, being a large industry in which they operate, do you predict we will see, um, do you predict we will see firms offering services specifically aimed at those types of clients? I don't mind kicking off with this one just because um, it has been a lot of the work that um, I've been doing over the last couple of years. And I think, um, I think, I don't think we'll see firms specifically aimed at these clients. I think what we'll see is, as I guess it's been in the media and entertainment space always is, you know, it's constantly changing, constantly developing. We are always applying our knowledge to new technology, to new, products, new ways of working. Um, and, you know, the same as other industries, it will just gradually develop and change, um, particularly with the rise of social media influencers. We've seen um, a real shift from that traditional celebrity endorsement agreement where, you know, David Beckham, where's a Tudor watch, so everybody now wants a Tudor watch, um, to more ambassador agreements, which obviously include influencers that have direct agreements, uh, sorry, direct relationships with their followers, um, with followers, you know, that trust their opinion, um, and they, you know, kind of really integrate themselves with the brand and work more closely. So you do kind of see that shift more gradually, but, you know, we still have endorsement agreements come across our desk, um, but I think, you know, there's always developments and changes within industry areas, but um, I don't, I, I, you know, open to what other people think, but I don't think you'll see firms specifically um, offering these services. I just think it will be the likes of Harbot and Lewis kind of recognising the trends in the industry and, you know, adapting our knowledge and skills and gradually, I guess, you know, um, moving along with the developed in technology. Does anyone have anything else to add on to that question? No, okay, we'll move on to the next one. Um, what are your thoughts on white label clothing and um, the implications and what if, if there is the implications of it that? Well, with white label clothing uh, issues that can arise can kind of go back to our conversation earlier about sustainability, transparency and supply chain issues. Um, yeah, when you're taking on someone else's product and branding it as your own, obviously what comes with that is the risk that you're taking a product without potentially seeing uh, where it's originating from. Um, so this is kind of more from a commercial side than an IP side, but um, you know, you look at the issues of modern slavery, you look at factories, you know, issues in the UK that we see factories facing in Leicester. Um, if you're willing to take on a uh, product and then brand it as your own and put it onto the market, you need to be very confident as to where that product comes from um, and whether that aligns to your brand image. Um, and then obviously there's the IP side of things that I'll hand over perhaps to, to Gina or Alice in respect to that.
Gina and Alistair. So I'm having some technical problems here. My internet is going in and out. So skip through me for now. Okay. We'll move to Alice. Um, I, I um, echo Lucy's sentiments about white labeling too. It's a matter of just doing due diligence and uh, quality control. And um, I, I think that uh, white labeling, I, I I think that it's true that this is some this is a model I think that's been increasing too, um, that's increasingly used in the industry. So uh, it does behoove the the company to really do their due diligence and ensuring that it matches their ethical standards and whatever it is that they're promoting and marketing. Thank you. So anyone else who wants to add on to that? No. Okay, we'll move to the next question. Um, what's any recommended books or online resources, podcasts to build my commercial awareness about fashion law? Um, so I know we've spoken earlier on and Gina said, you know, the business of fashion. And I can't remember the top of my head, um, one of the other books she recommended. Um, but yeah, what sort of um, resources are there that people can refer to to just build up on their commercial awareness for fashion law? Um, there's, a, there's a podcast that I um, listen to sometimes, which is called The Fit, um, which is on um, on Spotify, which I think is um, I, it's something, something that I would um, recommend. Um, and another kind of actually more US, well, actually it's a US kind of based project, podcast is um, The Label Law, which again, for, for those people who are in the US, that might be kind of um, of interest. But I think kind of other than kind of podcasts, um, I would say in order to, you know, to increase your commercial awareness is um, keeping an eye out, you know, for interesting news items that kind of help you form a view on what's going on in the industry um, and you know to help you kind of you know think about where the industry is going and you know like the medium to long term um, also I would say kind of attend well attending events like this but attending you know webinars um, you know which are you know particularly about different areas of law like I always find um, it's quite useful um, to attend a webinar you know which is about kind of you know like data protection or ip or something that's kind of not um my day-to-day -day, but which i do need to have an um an understanding of um at least at a high level um and that's something i mean that's something actually at fox williams in the sector group that we do because we have lawyers from all different areas of the firm so you know we have real estate lawyers employment lawyers um corporate commercial um and we kind of, you know, we all take it in terms to kind of do um, articles, so kind of like fashion focus um, articles, um, which concentrate on like, you know, certain developments in the industry. Um, recently, we've done, um, you know, webinars as well, which again, like that kind of thing, I just think it's really, yeah, it's a good idea to attend them, you know, where you can, um, because it just gives you kind of a different um, perspective, um, you know, on the industry. And it's just yeah, a good way of increasing your commercial awareness. Um, sorry, I don't know if everyone's got access to the chat, but Jean's just uh, mentioned, meant, uh, gosh, messaged in um, the book that she was referring to was called uh, The Company, what was it called? Sorry, I can't see it. Gosh. It's called The the Responsible Company. It, yeah, you the know, respons if, you're, if you want to learn about sustainability, that's a really good read. Thank you. And then also the fashion law, uh, www.thefashionlaw.com, um, the business of fashion. And Priya also mentioned, I think, the podcast, the Pit podcast, and the labor law um, as well, in terms of referring to. I think law firm articles are really um, helpful. Look for kind of a broad number of law firms in the UK, Europe, US, everywhere. Um, uh, they offer you know, viewpoints normally quite topical things that are going on in the industry. Um, we've got a website, fashionlaw.co.uk. You can find kind of all our um, articles and you know, all law firms will try and publish things on uh, platforms such as Lexology. Um, I'm not sure if you have to have a kind of a law firm website, but it's worth checking out. Um, Drapers, Business of Fashion, as, um, as everyone's mentioned, uh, Just Style, they're kind of UK based, I think. Um, you know, just read, read as much as you can. It gives you something to talk about when you meet with people um, and you can try and get other people's views um, on those topics, you know, interviews. I think that, that's something that's 
oh, it's also a, a way, I guess, to learn a bit more about the area, you know, when you're meeting with people, whether that be interviews or kind of more casual uh, events, fashion events that get held hopefully soon. Um, you know, being able to call on something that you've read and then be able to take someone else's view and try and kind of uh, see if that fits with your view. It's something that can add and build on your commercial experience, uh, commercial awareness. Thank you. Um, just learning, looking at the time, I think we'll take one more question and then we'll start to wrap up. Um, could you address the concept of product licensing and the potential for licensing a unique product to a large fashion brand? So I don't know who would want to start that one off. So it depends what kind of product, you know, and what kind of IP is around the product. Um, repeat the question again for me. Yeah, so could you address the concept of product licensing and the potential for licensing a unique pro product to a large fashion brand? Okay, so um, one of the examples I gave earlier, I'm working on a patent license agreement. Our client is a uh, startup that's developed a bit of fashion technology. And on the other side of the deal is um, a sustainable activewear brand that is owned by a celebrity. And if I said this celebrity, uh, not celebrity, but um, a very well-known sports figure. And if I said this person's name, everyone would know it. Um, and so, you know, I work on a lot of licensing deals. So that's one example of a patent license deal. I work on trademark license deals all the time. I work on um, copyright license deals. You know, it, it's just, it, it runs the gamut. And I, I, you know, like a lot of people on this panel, I'm not just doing it in the context of fashion. I do it often in the context of technology, tech companies and, I don't know, all different types of companies, but I do think as um, fashion pervades, as technology pervades more fashion, you're gonna see a lot more um, licensing around fashion technology and technology in general. And so what that means is the license is probably gonna be a patent license, which, you know, is a little unique. It's, it's you know, the patent laws, here in the United States and elsewhere are very different from copyright and trademark law. So it takes a little bit of specialization in that regard. Okay. So we would do kind of more the soft IP side of licensing um, in the commercial team at least. Um, the IP side might take over if it becomes a bit more of the hard IP, but for licensing, one of the key things that I always try and you know, uh, discuss with clients is in respect of what is it you're willing to give? Uh, what is it you're willing to give away? Because once you've given it away, um, it will reduce what you can do in the future in terms of your own kind of objectives as a brand as, or as a product designer, for example, but also what you can then give to others. And so keeping that in mind at the kind of very beginning stages of licensing can help. Um, you mentioned, I think in the question that um, here is that you're talking about a, a licensee that will be a big brand. Um, often there'll be template license agreements which cannot be you know, heavily negotiated. Um, normally that could present issues for um, perhaps like your new product design uh, company, but at the same time, it might be the only way to get your designs to market. So there's lots of kind of competing uh, issues that you have to bear in mind and try and look to the future rather than just the immediate uh, goal. Thank you. Is there anyone that wants to add on to that? No? Okay then, I think at this stage we'll close the Q&A um, segment. Um, please do remember that, you know, if your question wasn't read out and it wasn't answered in the webinar, there will be a follow-up blog post that will answer any outstanding questions that wasn't read out um, today. So, you know, 
don't worry about it. And also I do think someone did ask a question of whether this was being recorded and being made available. Um, I can confirm that it has all re been recorded in, you know, within the next couple of weeks, this will be um, made available to all attendees and just generally to the general public. Um, and then just closing remarks, um, I just wanna say thank you so much to Lucy, to um, Sophia, to Priya, to Gina, and to um, Alice for, you know, just sharing your insights into fashion law. Um, I know a lot of people really wanted um, to just learn how to get into fashion law, what steps they could take. Um, and what's really good is, you know, you've all come into fashion law with a different background, um, whether it's been the, you know, the traditional background or the unconventional way, but yet you're still here practicing fashion law, so it can be done. Um, so, you know, obviously we're virtually, but I can imagine there would be, you know, a round of applause for all of you. Um, but thank you so, so much for giving up your time um, to let us know, you know, what's out there for fashion law, and especially as, you know, women within the legal profession. And then just also to the attendees as well, thank you, you know, for tuning in um, to um, the first event of many. And we hope, you know, you were inspired and you got something out of it. Um, if you do want to, you know, learn more about the Fashion Law Edit, we're on Instagram, Twitter, and on LinkedIn as the Fashion Law Edit. Um, and then our website is www.thefashionlawedit.com where there is a, every week you know some sort of interview or blog post and yeah we look forward to hosting more of these events so thank you very much thank you very mu uh, much once again and i hope you all have a good evening a good morning or wherever you are situated in the world hope you have a good day thank you very much bye thank you thank you